Well, you were saying they're uh, looking ahead to next week. From Hamlet, yeah. There's that line in Hamlet where he says, and I can't, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get it exactly, but there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Yes. And so they're, um, we don't have everything nailed down. That's right. You know, we, we, we think we do, but maybe we don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and advocate the position that at least while you're reading the, the today's work and, and next week, in a certain sense, you have to at least be open to the idea that there are more things in heaven and earth that's right. dreamt of in your philosophy. In other words, that uh, I don't know if you, most of us are products of materialist, scientific education in which we kind of, you know, disenchant the world and, and um, so I think most people just can't take, you know, we sort of categorize a certain type of thing in literature and we go, oh, that's a work of the imagination, which it is. But your imagination has to work on something real, right? I mean, you have images and, and thought, you know, there are these things, you get this sense experience and then, you, and that's in your memory and you can pull it, you know, and that's, you know, pull it up into your imagination. Well, you know, it's not just something created. Uh, it, you know, you have to start with something real, but most of us, the only experience we ever have is from stories and they've been so, uh, especially a lot of them have been, um, they've been demeaned, and I don't want to offend anybody here, and maybe you should cover your daughters here. <laughs> and, um, but you know, people like Walt Disney, they just, right. they just completely ruin. You know, they sentimentalize, and, and you know, in a certain sense, they, I don't know, they, they make it difficult to at least be to be open to the idea about the uncanny. So, as I was telling these guys, I, I don't really have any, I don't have any issue with the idea of a middle creation between men and angels. As weird as that sounds, uh, at least, I'm not gonna say it's a matter of belief because if it turned out it was false, I'm not gonna be, but, but at least I'm open to it, and I think my, uh, I probably wasn't before I spent some time in Ireland, I made mention of being in Dublin. I really didn't spend much time in Dublin. I spent almost all my time when I was over there, I was there for nine months on the west of Ireland, and half of that time on the west side of, spent it on an island that was five miles off the coast of Ireland out in the North Atlantic Sea, and those people that lived on that island, they very definitely believed in the presence of something other. And these people weren't fools. I mean, as a matter of fact, I'd say they were a lot more commonsensical than a lot of, I mean, if you want to meet a fool, you know, walk around the neighborhood. You know, you'll bump into them all the time. I might be one of them, you know. I mean, I'm not ruling myself out as a possibility. But you know, these, these were people that were, were you know, they, they lived close to reality, you know. Uh, and, um, but they very much believed in ghosts and fairies. There were, on this island, there were at least two places that I can remember where there were fairy forts. And I'm, I'm sure an archeologist would say, well, it was probably the place of some strange druidical sacrifice. <laughs> rah, 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 rah. Well, that may be true, I don't know. But basically these stones placed in a circle. Um, and the, the, the people on the island, they thought, they just said, well, that, you know, you, well, first of all, they said, you don't go in there. You don't go in there. And of course, you know, we're kind of like, well, why? Why not? You know, well, you just don't. <laughs> that, you know, that's 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 where you know that that's where the fairy folk are. You know, you know, I never heard anybody talk about leprechauns mm -hmm. uh, in in Ireland. Never did, but I did hear people talk about the fairy. So, anyway, I do think if you at least as you're reading through this, it it actually makes I think the story better if you don't just sort of reduce the Green Knight 
to a symbol, although he is a symbol. But in a certain sense, when you make him, him an abstraction, you take away something in the, the sort of a, both a dramatic and a, say, a little bit of a comedic, you know, there's a certain amount of comedy here also. You know, it kind of takes it away. So, uh, and then next week, you know, I, as you read uh, Hamlet, I would encourage you uh, to at least, you, you gotta take the, the ghost of Hamlet's father seriously. Or else, this, the, or else the, it doesn't work, you know. Uh, now you, you know, we're not going to get into. The, we said, is there a theology of ghosts? Not. There's not much. There's a theology of protecting yourself yeah. from ghosts, but that's more kind of a practical thing. So, um, but both today and next week, you know, I think you have to sort of open yourself up to it. Just say, well. I don't know, maybe some of you have had experiences with the uncanny. Does anybody can say, yeah, I definitely have? Well, I have not, but <laughs> Father Jim definitely told me stories about when he's been called to people's houses, they're like, we need you to bless the house and exercise it because our kid screams every time she goes to the basement and swears there's somebody down there playing pool, like on the pool table that was left there by the previous owners. And like, oh, that's a bet. You should never buy a house with a pool table. <laughs> there you go. That's a sign the right there. Okay. I can, uh, yeah. And they had talked to the previous owner, and they said, "Oh, yeah, that's probably like Grandpa so and so." Like they believed it. They were like, "Oh, yeah, there's the spirit down there." And I was like, "Okay." And she was like, "I mean, I don't know, but the little girl like grabbed onto her dad, just going down to the basement, and was like." obviously very scared of something <laughs> so it wasn't just like an imaginary thing to yeah. her when you had your hand up your oh uh yeah well I, was, I had a number but uh i think it was about nine or ten that i saw a ghost and it was just like kind of like you just here described it was uh, uh kind of a human figure but it looked like it was just made out of light white light, and uh, I just saw it walk through uh, the glass patio doors and then just across the room and through the walls. And, just, it wasn't, and I, I never told my parents because my dad was the ghost. I'm sure we just didn't get a crazy <laughs> But years later, uh, I had discussed it with my mom, and suddenly she like, oh yeah, uh, uh, I would get someone tapping on my shoulder, mm -hmm. and they eventually saw um, human forms, actually three human forms, and my father just thought, are you crazy people, you know? <laughs> and until he started seeing them as well. Oh, well, there was a mass hallucination, what, I don't know. But it's, um, it changes your perspective from yeah. there on. And I learned you can't ever convince anyone else that they exist by your own uh, witness, witness yeah. they, they really just have to experience themselves. Yeah. Otherwise, they won't believe it. You, as you were talking, Howard, I was thinking, you know, that we're really, what you're asking us to do is really more than just suspend disbelief. It, it's really kind of embracing the, the possibility of, you know, it's believing something, believing that something is possible, that we post-enlightenment folks don't generally believe is possible. But the, the people who wrote, told these stories, absolutely believe this was possible. They, they this wasn't just, you know, when, when we get to the Green Knight, when he shows up, I think that's a tip off to most of us, oh, this is a work of fiction. But that wouldn't have been the response of people who, who first heard this. They would have thought, well, that's odd, but mm -hmm. odd things happen. Yeah. Well, we, we dissect stories differently, and I think it was in the introduction to this that we were laughing that, you know, it has J.R.R. Tolkien written really big on the cover. Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> the, the Tolkien estate has done a good job of, you know, putting his brand on 
on things, and, and he did translate the work, uh, uh, but I think I think you said you bought it when you were in high school because it had oh, totally yeah. the same money. Like, yeah, you, you think you would say anonymous? I'm <laughs> <laughs> down here translating right. right now. <laughs> It was even published pos posthumously. Yeah. Yeah. Which a lot wasn't of was, published when yeah, he was alive. Good, uh, Christopher found it in his papers, I think. Um, but anyways, he, he talks about that in the short introduction that, that his son put together from his notes, if you had a chance to read it in here or if you found it online. But uh, he talks a little bit about that. Of the, and throughout Tolkien's writings, he, he mentions this, that modern readers tend to read things um, kind of anachronistically in the sense of that you know, a, a reader of Middle English, uh, or you know, if you talk about Beowulf, which we read last week, um, it was just a totally different category of reading that they didn't even have, that we have these filters and, and kind of these categories that we put things in uh, subconsciously almost. I mean, or at least even if it's conscious, it just happens immediately. So we read it and we take these clues, we take these literary clues, and then we direct it to a different part of our brain almost of like, okay, this is fantasy, but that the original readers uh, wouldn't have done that. And uh, things like authorship, so you mentioned that it was anonymous, so Tolkien reflects that that's a beautiful thing to just consider that this is, we don't even know who wrote this. And, you know, modern readers, we tend to slap people's names on them, and we want to, like, who wrote this? And, like, what we want to know about the identity of the person, but... Then we read, then we read in the, the writer's right. life into it, and begin to interpret, you know, it's, right. you know, it's yeah. Yeah, and he... Uh, he mentions that it, it's just kind of an example of that we think we have a, a handle on our literary history and we really don't. That we, ju we just know just kind of a fraction of this cumulative literary history. So we have stories that are repeated, um, we have authors who are quoted and people don't even know their names necessarily. Um, but then certainly think kind of the mysterious component. Um, and I think he, he, uses, he does use the language of you know, suspending your disbelief uh, and then that the, the integrity of the story is part of the genius, right? Is that that if the tor if the story is told well, a person who's reading it um, with some humility should be able to read everything as being true. Yeah. Now, whether that's true in the language he uses as the the primary world or the secondary world, um, that kind of doesn't matter as long as you're willing to to say this is true at least in this world. And as we were speculating the other day, we think that J.R.R. Tolkien himself had no problem admitting the, the concrete reality of it. But even if you're not able to get there, at least through the course of the story, it's essential to, to getting what you need to know out of the story. And which Tolkien says is one of the genius of, uh, one of the genius aspects of the more ancient way of reading is that they were able to just focus on what does this story say to me now, basically. What does this story saying to me in my time and place um, without worrying too much about some of those other details. So, um, Plus he was only 25 years old when he translated it. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? I, I didn't catch that. And it was 10 years later that he started working on Okay. Still very very early. Um, well, I, I wanted to kind of read a couple of lines from The Wife of Bath's Tale. Sure. Uh, it reminded me, uh, in the Canterbury Tales, which we read last year, you might remember from The Wife of Bath's Tale, I thought it was pertinent to, to our story today, it begins like this. When good King Arthur ruled in ancient days, a king that every Briton loves to praise, this was a land brimful of fairy folk. The elf queen and her courtiers joined and broke. Their elfin dance on many a green mead, or so was the opinion once, I read, Hundreds of years ago in days of yore, but no one now sees fairies anymore. For now the saintly charity and prayer of holy friars seems to have purged the air. They search the countryside through field and stream, as thick as motes that speckle a sunbeam. Blessing the halls, the chambers, kitchens, bowers, cities and boroughs, castles, ports and towers. Thorpes, barns, and stables, outhouses, and dairies. And that's the reason why there are no fairies. Wherever there was wont to walk an elf, today there walks the holy friar himself. As evening falls, or when the daylight springs, saying his matins and his holy things, walking his limit round from town to town, 
women can now go safely up and down by every bush or under every tree. There is no other incubus but he. No. <laughs> so, well, something. <laughs> so, in other words, we'd be better off with the fairies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in light of what you hear about these days, there may be some truth there. Right, right. Oh, no. And if you're, and then the, through the course of the story, then she goes back, and the story she tells is supposed to be set in King Arthur's Day, the story of the knight, who, interestingly enough, um, I read this late last night. Uh, he, it, there, he, in the Wife of Bath's Tale, the, uh, the knight is guilty at the beginning of the story, um, and then is exonerated. He's going to be put to death. He's exonerated, and then, kind of, his sentence is is a testing where he has 12 months to, to go and find out something. If you remember from that story, he has to go find out what it is that every woman wants. That's his quest. And so he, has to, he leaves for 12 months and has to return. So there's kind of some, some similarities in that story, too. But. The, so already there, it seems to me like already in Chaucer, you have a little bit, it's funny, but a little bit of demythology, demythologization mm -hmm. going on. He's, um, because there it seems to me that the fairies are being associated with demons. Mm -hmm. uh, would, does that, would you agree? Yeah, uh, I agree, yeah, he, he doesn't seem, he's kind well, he's, of poking yeah. fun at... Uh, well, he, you know, he, he's more of a, well, he's from London, he's yeah. traveled, and he's, he has begun, he's been to Italy and seen the beginnings of the Renaissance. So right. you're, you're looking at a person who's kind of, it's kind of shifting from one mindset maybe to something else where I would, the poet of, of this poem seems to be more firmly just sort of rooted in place in, in the west of England. And, yeah. and as, you know, it, it's kind of like here, you know, like whatever crazy thing is happening on one of the coasts, it takes about five years for it to reach out here. And it's probably all, you know, whatever is the current thought in London, it's gonna take a little while for that to yeah. trickle out there. Um, but you can even just see by the choice of poetry that Chaucer chose, that, you know, in, in Middle English, which by the way, this is, I don't know what this is, it's not, this is not really Middle English, because Middle English, you, you could pick that up and you could make heads or tails mm -hmm. out of it, but... It's from the Midlands. You know, it, it's it, a different style. It, it's, it's Middle English, but it's, it's okay. Midlands. Okay, it, it's, but it's oh, really okay. not, it's different. Yeah, it's, it's different. 150 miles northwest of so it's amazing what that a little distance will, will you know, we're kind of in a little bit of a different environment here. And I, I don't, is it more rustic? It's more rustic, yeah. So, and some of it you can read, but there are some things which you don't give any. Rachel has the Middle English over here. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of fun to look at. Yeah. But it, I was fun to look at, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why Tolkien would like it because, yeah. you know, well, he's a linguist, you know, that's right up his alley, you know, trying to figure what's... It's less Normanized yes. than I, I noticed. But it's not Beowulf. No. It's, it's got... You know, I was going to say that a book that um, you might find, if you don't already own it, which, if you're interested, I, I highly recommend it, is The Discarded Image by C.S. Lewis, uh, in which he tries to um, help a modern, postmodern reader at least have some sense of the kind of what a medieval early Renaissance imagination would be like. And, um, and, and there's really, a, there's a lot of really pretty wonderful things in here, but he has a, he, he talk, you know, he says, well, how, how did the medieval mind look at the cosmos and understand there, there was a real sense of order and hierarchy and, um, he says something like, well, just, just when you think that they had it all, everything was neatly figured out. How does he put it here? Um, he says, the human imagination, I was talking about the way they understood the, the cosmos. The human imagination has seldom had before it an object so sublimely ordered as the medieval cosmos. If it has an aesthetic fault, it is perhaps for us who have known Romanticism, a shade too ordered. 
For all its vast spaces, it might in the end afflict us with a kind of claustrophobia. Mm -hmm. Is there nowhere any vagueness, no undiscovered byways, no twilight? Can we never get really out of doors? The next chapter will give us some relief. Then you go to the next chapter, and he has, a, it's called the long JV, mm -hmm. which simply means the long-lived ones, the long-lived ones. And he goes in, he, and he, he, it's a fairly long chapter where he kind of, kind of unfolds, you know, the, how things were understood. He says that he, he chose not to call the chapter fairies because he says that word tarnished by pantomime and bad children's books <laughs> with worse illustrations <laughs> would have been dangerous as the title of a chapter. It might encourage us to bring to the subject some ready-made modern concept of a fairy and to read the old text in light of it. So he's really trying to kind of try to dispel that. Um, and he, he, he distinguishes, he says, if you look at the literature of the time, there are, are basically three kinds of fairies. And by, by the way, he mentions the wife of Bath that you read that was, um, but what he, he says, well, there are the, the little people, you know, which we might be say are the leprechauns. Uh, and he said, but you know, in a certain sense that, they're, that's not when people say fairy, they're thinking about probably what they're, at least and especially in this poem, they're talking what he calls the high fairy. So there are, there are the, the little people, I guess are the low fairies. There are the ogres and the demons and the clearly malevolent creatures that are neither angels nor men. And then there are these high fairies who are, they're, they're very strange. And um, With that, that, I think that I think the Green Man, according to C.S. Lewis, is falls into that category. Okay. Would dwarves fall in this category? Mm. I think like a I don't different know. kind of creation, like a because I mean, they're not. Um, and of course, dwarves aren't in all of European literature, and I don't think they f figure as much in English or Celtic literature as they do in the Germanic. But but they're not they're not little people. They're hmm. right. Yeah, they're kind of. I guess I'm, I'm thinking more of like Tolkien's description of their creation in the summer yeah. early on is that it's a. They're not, by, not created by a Louvatar, kind of created uh, which, which of the, which of the uh, Avar, so the, but the Valar creates them, which, whichever one of the Valar creates the dwarves, mm -hmm. it's a kind of creating it with a good intention, but kind of a, so almost an unintentional subversion. Yeah. Um, but, are, but they're good and they kind of display a more earthly quality, right? They're, right. That's why they're stubborn, they're skilled, they're they're a less. They're not as high as the as the um, elves. Mm -hmm. So L Lewis says that the high fairies are, and then when I when you re hear this description, it makes you think of the Green Knight. I think the high fairies are vital, energetic, willful, passionate things, and they're a little bit. You know they're they're fascinating and yet they're also a little a little frightening. Not frightening in the sense of of dwarves and ogres and trolls and and I have to say I I don't you know I'm, I haven't run across any ogres or trolls in my life. Well, maybe I have, but anyway. <laughs> um, but that that kind of fairy I I don't. I don't really know. My, I don't have any opinion about it one way or the other. But the high fairy. You know, after my experience in, in Ireland, I'm, I'm definitely open to the idea that there might be some another level of creation that we can't quite account for. There are lots of theories about what that might be. Are they fallen angels? Uh, were they, you know, the one theory is that, well, when Satan fell, there were others that were sort of, they were like the Swiss. 
you know, they didn't really, <laughs> they didn't really <laughs> want to get involved in the great war between heaven and hell. And so God said, well, that's fine. Well, then, you're, you know, and this is, you, you know, so I guess that, I guess Ireland would be Switzerland then, because that's where they've been, uh, you know, I, I don't know. And there, those are all just theories and everything. Um, uh, but the, the, you know, at least for some people, especially the Celts, that this is a this is a reality for them that there is something there which they can't. Norway thing that Chris and Lavin's daughter I remember the crazy in the woods. Well, that that yeah. was interesting. You brought that up because we talked about that on Friday. That mm -hmm. that very definitely that's in there, and so it would have been. And you know, I don't know. I mean, I I think there's evidence in in you know the uh, well, I don't know about the Spanish. But you know, you see, you see, you know, there's evidence of this in, you know, French and Italian folk tales. So there was an article uh, I read just yesterday. The um, headline: No doubt, Iceland's elves exist. Anthropologists certain the creatures live alongside regular folks. He's interviewed hundreds of people who have actual physical experiences with them. And they said sometimes they take on human form, or like shapeshifters. Yeah, so. shapeshifters. So that's one of the things that, that Lewis says they're they're you know they they they're they're very vivid and energetic, and there's a certain kind of, but they're also elusive, and and so um, they're they're hard to kind of pin down, you know. And this isn't just a European phenomenon, either. I mean, this is. All cultures, right? Although they have something like this, yeah. There's a well, maybe we ought to start talking about the Green Knight, yeah. shall we? So what we thought we would do uh, today would be actually just um, we really haven't done this much, but we thought maybe we'd just read a little bit of the poem itself, and um, and then maybe use that as a, a jumping off point. And did we decide we'd start with? When the Green Knight shows up, yeah. oh, one yeah. more thing we we have to say um, the the you know what this is really something that I was thinking about on the way over here. I have no idea, but the um, the occasion for all this to happen, you know, it's Christmas time, and you could say this is you know this is a Christmas, it's a festive poem, uh, perhaps created by the poet to be recited or almost in a way performed. Uh, you know, during the, the Christmas octave. And I was thinking, you know, to be this merry and celebrate that long would wear me out, you know? I, you know, I mean, it's, it's really kind of wonderful, you know? They're singing carols and they're going to mass and they're feasting and it goes on and on and hey, then it's New Year and hey, you know? And um, uh, the, the, that, that book by Joseph Pieper on festivity, he quotes somebody that said, you know, it's not so hard to plan a festival. It's, it's difficult to find people who can actually do it, you know. And, and I was thinking, yeah, and as much as I am an advocate of festival, I think I'd be worn out by the time that <laughs> hot is over, you know. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> Didn't really put much of a damper on things. Not as much as you would think, <laughs> you know. I mean, I think that just gave him more, one more reason to have drink some more. You know? <laughs> have another round. You know? um, Happy but, New Year. Yeah, but it, it is sad that you know in our culture, you know, we begin celebrating Christmas at uh, at Thanksgiving and completely forget about Advent, and then finally the day arrives. And you're just kind of worn out, and it's like, oh, we gotta take down the tree tomorrow, and you know. And, and I always think it's so sad. You're driving around during the octave, and you see all these trees out by the yeah. driveway, and think, yeah. uh, we've kind of got things turned around here a little bit, you know. This is when it's supposed to begin. Um, but anyway, that there, there, you know. So there, there is a real. You can see that the pattern here between Christmas and New Year is really kind of our sort of bookends. Uh, the whole thing, but we're going to pick it up. Where, what, I think what, stanza seven. Is it seven? Mm -hmm. But I, we were talking about why Christmas as well, and uh, you know, Dusty, you, you mentioned that you know, that's kind of where the the boundaries between the worlds are a little um, less 
fixed uh, according, like, it's one of those times where... Yeah, it's kind of, uh, sometimes it's described as a uh, liminal realm yeah. where there's, kind of you're talking about the just ambiguity of that this was a time that, and you uh, mentioned, Teresa mentioned Kristen Lovren's daughter, so I kept thinking about that during our planning on Friday, that there was a great New Year's Eve, or sorry, Christmas Eve scene there where they were going to celebrate the Midnight Mass, and it was this kind of ritual and um, very solemn and kind of fearful as they were making their way to the chapel because it was that this was a time anything could happen on, on New Year's Eve, and that was a time that there were and there were certain things that they would do to kind of protect themselves and to uh, <coughs> be uh, conducive to good spirits and kind of to protect themselves a bit um, to those things that were unknown. Is, it, is this why we associate elves with Santa Claus? Is that I never thought of that. Well, it could be I, I mean, that, that's certainly a uh, bastardization right. of the idea. Yeah, I never thought of that. It could be something in the history there. Christmas Carol. Oh yeah, the right. You get the ghosts of right on Christmas Eve. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Because and it was they say that like the the English would tell ghost stories yeah. on Christmas. Mm -hmm. That was the mm -hmm. it wasn't Halloween. It was yeah. Christmas. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I think there are, there are places and times you know in our material existence where you know the the, the the wall between this world and something else gets a little thinner. Yeah. You know, I think there was an awareness of that. Yeah. Uh, there's certainly places like that where, you know, you go and, and you have a, you know, you just, there's a certain sense that, you know, uh, um, this isn't, you know, I'm getting close to some other place, you know. Um, but I also think religious holidays should be kind of like that too, but we, oh, I don't want to get off on <laughs> We've had a pretty tight track so far. We would want to jump off of it. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't want to go into a tirade. So, anyway. all right, here we go. So, we're on, I, on this. If you have this one, I'm on. This is page 28. Um, okay. Stanza seven. Stanza seven. And I, I'll read a few, and then I'll invite anybody else to take over because I have no intention of reading all of this. Okay. Now of their service, I will say some say nothing more, for you are all well aware that no want would there be. Another noise that was new drew near on a sudden, so that their lord might have leave at last to take food. For hardly had the music but a moment ended, and the first course in the court, as was custom, been served, when there passed through the portals perilous horsemen, the mightiest on middle earth in measure of height. From his gorge to his girdle, so great and so square, and his loins and his limbs so long and so huge, that half a troll upon earth I trow that he was, but the largest man alive at least I declare him. And yet the seemliest for his size that could sit on a horse for though in back and in breast his body was grim, both his paunch and his waist were properly slight, and all his features followed his fashion so gay in mode. For at the hue men gaped aghast in his face and form that showed, as a fay man fell he passed, and green all over glowed. So, you know, so the poet says he's a, he's a fey man. Fey man fell. When you guys want to read the next one? Sure. All of green they were made, both garments and man, a coat tight and close that clung to his sides, a rich robe above it, all arrayed within, with fur finely trimmed, showing fair fringes, of handsome ermine gray, gay, as his hood was also, that was lifted from his locks and laid on his shoulders, and trim hose tight drawn of tincture alike, that clung to his calves, 
and clear spurs below, of bright gold on silk broideries banded most richly, though unshod were his shanks, for shoeless he rode. And verily all this vesture was a verdure clear, both the bars on his belt and bright stones besides, that were richly arranged in his array so fair, set on himself and on his saddle upon sick f silk fabrics. It would be too hard to rehearse one half of the trifles that were embroidered upon them, what with birds and with flies, in a gay glory of green and ever gold in the midst. The pendants of his poidrel, his proud crupper, crupper, his moilens and all the metal, to say more, were enameled. Even the stirrups that he stood in were stained of the same, and his saddle bows in suit, and their sumptuous skirts, which ever glimmered and glinted all with green jewels. Even the horse that upheld him in hue was the same, I tell, a green horse great and thick, a stallion stiff to quell. Embroidered bridle quick, he matched his master well. Very gay was this great man, guised all in green, and the hair of his head with his horses accorded. Fair flapping locks enfolding his shoulders, a big beard like a bush over his breast hanging, that with the handsome hair from his head falling, was sharp shorn to an edge just short of his elbows, so that half his arms under it were hid, as it were in a king's capados that encloses his milk, his neck. The mane of that mighty horse was of much the same sort, well curled and all combed with many curious knots, woven in with gold wire about the wondrous green. Ever a strand of the hair and a string of the gold, the tail and the top lock were twined all to match, and both bound with a band of a brilliant green with dear jewels bedight to the knock-dock's ending. And twisted then on top was a tight-knitted knot on which many burnished bells of bright gold jingled. Such a mount on middle earth or man to ride him was never beheld in that hall with eyes ere that time, for there his glance was as lightning bright. So did all that saw him swear, no man would have the might they thought his blows to bear. And yet he had not a helm, nor a hauberk either, nor a pisan, nor not a plate that was proper to arms, not a shield, not a shaft for shock or for blow, but in one hand he held a holly bundle, that is, greatest in greenery when groves are leafless, and an axe in the other, ugly and monstrous, a ruthless weapon, a right for one in rhyme to describe, head was as large and as long as an L wand, a branch of green steel and of beaten gold. The bit burnished bright and broad at the edge, as well shaped for shearing as sharp razors. The stem was a stout staff by which sternly he gripped it, all bound with iron about to the base of the handle and engraven in gold, green in graceful patterns lap round with a lanyard that was lashed to the head, and down the length of the half was looped many times, and tassels of price were tied there in plenty, to bosses of the bright green braided most richly. Such was he that now hastened in, the hall entering, pressing forward to the dais, no peril he feared. To none gave he greeting, gazing above them, and the first word that he winged, now where is, he said, the governor of this gathering? For gladly I would on this same set my sight, and with himself now talk in town. On the courtiers he cast his eye and rolled it up and down. He stopped and stared to his spy, who there had most renown. We got to stop there for a minute and talk about it because we'll get we'll get before the challenge. So, well, one thing we know is he's green <laughs> because that that word repeated. And but you know, did you notice that also that it's that gold is mentioned also 
not as much. You know the jewels, but there there is you know that that the, you have that that word, and I notice it it appears in other places too. Green, 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 and gold. Um, and so there's you know I suppose one thing you can say like well what what is that? What do we know? Well he's green. Well, what do we what does that mean? What 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 does that you know what how, what do we associate with greenness? Um, well obviously life. Uh, you know, one thing you can think of, there seems to be something, you know, that as we find out, this is a, a this is a vital creature, mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. this green knight. And there, so we, we think of green as being, you know, representing life. Yes, um, springtime, actually. Right. Nature. Nature. And he's holding the holly bough that um, mm -hmm. is an evergreen, it mentions it's the only thing that's green when everything else is is kind of dead. And right. Which does anybody know? I know the holly is associated with some druidic something or other. I I don't know what. I read it one time. I don't remember now. But you know, But it's interesting that he has that in one hand. Yeah. Um, and yet we the holly has become part of our Christmas you know celebration. Well, what was it? Saint, was it Saint Boniface? The story of the evergreen tree, where he cut down the, yeah. the yeah. kind of the changing of the. So I wonder if Holly was part of that, whatever pagan pagan festival that was, kind of converted to a Christian. It almost seems, which I did. This didn't really occur to me the, on the first the first pass, but reading this now, it almost seems like there's something out of season. Um, you know, so it's like he, he's this magnificent figure, but there's something that doesn't, just doesn't quite fit. Um, so the author mentions um, the, the improper nature of his arms. <coughs> so he doesn't have proper arms. Right. It, 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 you know, the poet is really stressing that, that he, he doesn't have a shield. You know, he, he's got holly. And an axe, and an axe, you know, which is clearly not a, a weapon of chivalry. Yes. The holly definition, meaning, tradition. It says um, he's looked it up. That it is mentioned in here the Christ form. I remember seeing that in the story. Yeah. And it's a symbol of the crown of thorns placed on Jesus' head mm. before he died on the cross. And there's references to Christ. Oh, sure. So I think that maybe yeah, I mentioned. Huh, that's interesting. But, but I think what we, we see all through, like this poem and all the stuff we're talking about is, here you have Christianity and the older pagan world that are just butted up right next to each other. And, and you have all these places where Christians have, um, they haven't just discarded all of the the traditions and the, the beliefs that their ancestors had, but they've continued to maintain them, but with this new framework of the Christian revelation of the gospel. I think that's what you see going on here. So, so that's what the, the Kali comes to mean, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it represents for the Green Knight. Well, there's also this Celtic definition. The oak attracts lightning and the holly repels lightning. It was often planted around homes for protection from lightning and was viewed as a symbol of protection. Really? They're planted around our home. And I know that. You, so you won't have lightning? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. but, but they're there in the winter yeah. when everything's mm -hmm. oh, yeah, around beautiful. and around and lifeless. And these, these are so shiny and yeah. beautiful and green. And they brighten things up. They yeah. they remind us that there's beauty in dang places. <laughs> yeah. I think one of you already mentioned it, but it's also I could not I, I couldn't help but keep thinking about the Green Man, the Celtic yeah. tradition. I was thinking all of this that somehow this is a reincarnation of the Green Man into this that age, that era. You know, yeah. They re-experience him in this new way. 
to a Christian experience. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's quite possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, um, as I was doing some research on this, uh, that, you know, you mentioned the green man, that, that in England, there are, uh, in cathedrals, there were, I saw this pictures uh, actually online of, um, especially on capitals, you know how, you know, in some Gothic churches there are gargoyles and strange creatures. In, in, um, in, in England, I, there are probably some other places, but this guy would have pictures from cathedrals in England. There, there are pictures of the green man, and he's, it, it's like a man's face, but it's all foliage. You know, yeah. and and that that he's they'll put him up in little capsules and stuff like well you know like okay so is that kind of like a, what exactly are you trying to get at but the the um, uh, the green man found his way you know in, into sculpture and into art. Um, of course, then, you, then you're kind of like well, what does a green man mean? Well, he somehow I don't know nature. I guess, which in, in a certain which I think is good. I'm glad you brought that up because he is the personification of nature. Yeah, which you know we have to also remember that it, to a certain extent, the, the Green Knight and and these creatures are not really. We were talking about this that, that they're they're not. You can't really say they're immoral. They're really amoral because they're not human beings. They they haven't they haven't been. Christ redeeming sacrifice in a certain way doesn't really apply to them. They, they don't really, it's hard to say they're, it would be wrong to say they're totally evil. Mm -hmm. uh, you certainly can't say they're, at least from the way we think of goodness, you can't say they're, but, but in a certain way they don't fall into that category. It's like nature, is nature good or is nature, well sometimes nature is really good and then sometimes you get, your house gets struck by a lightning or a tornado comes by and wipes out your town or you know you have an earthquake or you know a tidal wave or whatever i mean it's hard you know you could say well so in a certain sense you you know if you think about it in one way well it doesn't fit neatly into kind of the category of is this good or is it evil it, it kind of and lewis says that they, they sort of it, it sort of is what it is you know uh, it doesn't neatly fall into our standards of, of figuring things. Um, One of you mentioned animism earlier, which I think was so important because it's the belief that spirits exist in nature, so like say a cave or a rock or And so this is, to me, this character is filled with spirits. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the, um, so on this question of, of green, and I don't know if this would apply to the green man so much, but you have this idea of, of youth, uh, regeneration, but because of regeneration, you get a little bit of a, an idea of um, concupiscence, you know, or maybe that's not the right word, because that, um, but there, there is something, there's a little bit of, Something erotic going on yeah. here, certainly with the the with the, the, the lady of the house, yeah. you know, pretty clear. Yeah. Um, and so you know, you have this certain sense of sort of um, how can I put this? Let's see, you know, uh, reproductive energies unbridled in nature. You yeah. know, how about that? Um, you just and and that's just you know, is that good or well, that's the way it is. You know, and yet we were also mentioning. So here we have green and the green man and nature, but also, I think Matthew brought up that you know he said, well, but green is the color of death. So you end up with this kind of duality there. Yeah. Of course, everything in nature comes into being and it goes out of being. So there's a sense of that green is the sign of life, but it's the sign of Death. Now, why? Why did that? I have to say I, that didn't come to mind until you you brought it. Why? Why do well, you think that? I'm just because I think of green. It's associated with decay. But the reason I, I I thought about that is towards the end. I don't know if I can find this, but um, where he kind of reveals his identity somewhat to Gawain, he says that Morgan Le Fay has enchanted him and. It, 
it, it sounds as though he was at one time a normal human being, uh, at least there, who has been uh, enchanted and given, I would say, a natural long life or maybe even resurrected, not, or reanimated, not resurrected. Um, and um, you, you mentioned the part, like, and I was looking for this and I couldn't find it again, where it talks about the, it describes his home as um, a barrow, yeah, um, which is a tomb. Um, so I, I'm not yeah, sure. The, the grant the chapel is mm -hmm. is, is a type of tomb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. So so there there's very definitely this sense of you know, there's something dead or undead about. Right? Yeah, I think he's an undead. Mm -hmm. I would say is a, a good way of yeah. describing him. So, well, the, the word revenant, you know? Yeah, revenant, yeah. Uh, some, you know, sort of the undead. Um, so when you, th you throw that in there, that, now that gets a little bit, that's a little frightening. Yeah. You know? Uh, so there is something about this night that is, you can't help but be intrigued by him. There's something very, uh, in some ways, he almost steals the show, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and the, uh, you have, I think you have to be careful that you, you don't let him steal the show because, you know, he's not the hero of the story. But that being said, he is, he, you know, something in, attractive and it's something also a little repellent. Here, it's in a uh, stanza 98. I found it. So, uh, this is where uh, Gamwain has shown that he had this girdle that protects him. Um, and then he asks, um, but one thing I would pray you, if it displease, displeaseth you not, since you are the Lord of yonder land, where I lodged for a while in your house and in honor, may he who reward, may he you reward, who upholdeth the heavens and on high sitteth. How do you announce your true name, and then nothing further? That I will tell thee truly, then return the other. Bertilach de Halt Desert, hereabouts I am called who thus have been enchanted and changed in my hue by the might of Morgan le Fay that in my mansion dwelleth, and by cunning of lore and crafts well learned, the magic arts of Merlin she many hath mastered, for dearly, deeply in dear love she dealt on the time with that accomplished clerk, as at Camelot runs the fame. And Morgan the goddess is therefore now her name, none power and pride possess too high for her to tame. Um, and then he goes on to say that she's the one that put him up to this whole thing of going there. So then to afflict the fair queen. It's yes. really all against Guinevere. Right. It's yes. more of a say against Guinevere. Yeah. So, yeah. That's what's underneath the whole thing. Yeah, Howard pointed out that when he, he gets his head locked off, he holds it up to the fairest there. And I just read that and thought, and he said, well, that's obviously Gwyneth. It wasn't obvious to me. Yeah, so did you notice that he, he's, actually, he doesn't ad address Gwyneth, he's no. addressing. He doesn't even know who Arthur is. Right. That's an insult, really, when he goes and says, Well, he, yeah, he has to, yeah. you know, that passage that we just read, there's, you know, maybe we probably, um, there is such a, you know, a, a different aspects of him, but, you know, for someone to, well, ride your steed into a hall, and then immediately demand, you know, who's in charge here, you know? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that, that's discourteous. It's somebody that's famous. And yeah, you know, and, you know, and everybody, it, it's really kind of amazing just how composed and courteous they are in return. Like, you know, so this guy is so completely rude, you know, mm -hmm. and that they, you know, you know, they kind of listen to him and they, they, they yeah. Um, what he does, he steps into a Christian celebration, and most dis disconcertingly uh, creates a non-Christian healing, if you will. Yeah. Well, the, the, in the in the Maury Moroff's edition, what she points out is this is an ancient, the motif of the green man's decapitation originates in very ancient folklore, probably in a vegetation myth in which the beheading would have been a ritual death and ensured the return of spring. 
So he gets his head lopped off every year. Yeah. So that he comes back every year. So that is that's head regeneration. And then, so is he then kind of asking for another ritual sacrifice to take his place in the next year with with Galen? Oh, that could be. I don't know. Well, this. I mean, like we talked about, you know, our, our, the way we tend to read stories, and we kind of jump to conclusions. And so, I suspect that that most people, myself included, the first pass of this story, kind of just puts this in the category of the fantastic and kind of uh, as a spectacle. But it seems like there's something, as we've been talking about, something much larger going on here. And even the question of like Glenn mentioned, the, you know, the, the pagan that, that this is a conflict between Christianity and paganism. Even at the very beginning of the story, um, you know, there's this, the anonymous author is hinting that something disorderly is about to happen, I think. Yeah. That, there's, that there's some chaos impending, and, and even, um, and Howard, you were saying that this was kind of a stock way to introduce stories, but, but that he starts with mentioning Troy, and that you know the, the Troy fell yeah. due to the actions of a traitor, um, yeah. and so it's like we're kind of on guard that like Camelot becomes like the Troy, and this is a Greek kind yeah. of striding yeah. in here. You know, and at first I was thinking like, okay, whatever, and I thought, well, you know, because who, who's really the who's really it mentioned you know these soldiers at Troy. But I was thinking, well, if you really want to think about it, isn't it's Helen? Yeah, uh -huh. it's Helen, right? You know, and of course you could argue, well, you know, she was un, under the, you know, what the command or the spell or something, whatever. But but she is, and she and Helen is also in a certain sense a type of temptress. Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, maybe yeah. there is, but but she's never met Helen is never right. mentioned at all. But but if you think of Troy. Um, you know, she, she is the face that launched a thousand ships, you know. Um, is Helen and Guinevere, are they kind of... Well, that's what I started thinking, like, well, okay, well, uh, Helen was unfaithful to her husband. Guinevere was unfaithful to her husband. I, I mean, maybe there is some, I don't know, it's she all speculation. She hasn't been yes now. I mean, because this yeah. is Gawain, Lancelot isn't even... Um, well, that was a question, do you think, I mean, of course, this is. This is before Lancelot. She is in her thoughts. Yeah, but the the um, see that that's a really good question because it would have been well I don't know what but you know is the poet following chronologically in this you know the way these stories were you know the plot unfolded or is he kind of looking backward and that Guinevere actually has. I don't know. Right. I mean, it hmm. it would help explain a little bit why, um, you know, the motivation of for um, Morgan Le Fay. I don't know, unless there's some other motivation for her that why why does she have it out for Guinevere? Did she have it out for her before? Hmm. Um, does she Guinevere know had, had Morgan Le Fay banished from the kingdom, but. So I don't know, and I, my, I, it's been a long time since I've read those other stories. It's all just kind of a, a jumble in my mind right now. Um, so we're going to have to take a break yeah, here. But I, I want to just throw out one more idea. I didn't get. I read this, and, and and I don't know what I think about this, but it's interesting. Since we're I want to wrap up the color green, so we've had you know that you know life, death, um, but according to one author that. Um, in the, the, the audience would have also understood green as the color for truth. And quote, it said like, so for instance, it was quoted that in one of the first miracle plays that we have, that, that um, it's clear that the green is, is associated with truth. There were certain colors in the miracle play that represented mm -hmm. different virtues. And at first I thought, oh, okay, well, how's that figure? And then I thought, well, in a certain sense, at the end of the poem, he is sort of the executioner of truth. Yeah. You know, he, you know, he, he does pass judgment 
Uh, and, and it's a truthful judgment. You know, for a guy as, as crazy as he kind of is, uh, at that very last scene, boy, he completely just understands it. And he gives a just judgment, you know. And so, boy, you throw that one in there. So we have life, death, truth. Uh, you know, you can see it's a complicated, we're looking at a lot of different ideas here. It's hard to pin it down. Wait a minute. How is the executioner of truth just? How is that a just judgment? Well, because he, he, he would you agree you that he gave a, well, first of all, it was his job to pass judgment on, are we going to say Gowan or Gawain? Yeah. <laughs> I, I also looked that up the other day, and guess what I found out? People, you know, some people say it's Gowan, some people say it's Gawain. You say Gowan, I don't know. <laughs> I've always said gaming. Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> I didn't really mean that. That was rude. <laughs> that was just rude. He's the was, executor of that, truth. That, that, that was. That was. I listened to two audible versions, um, and one was with a British actor, and he said the way. I know, but then I, then I so I also heard people say, hey, who knows? It, it's, I'm not going to get on that one. But, <laughs> Uh, but now I say it both ways, and that you ought to, you ought to be consistent. Uh, but anyway, going back, you know, so, you know, he, you know, the, the, the whole, um, uh, the, the beheading game, the, the, the game of exchanging things, it's all, it's all tied together, and it's all supposed to sort of, it, he, you know, Gowan's integrity is being tested. Yes. And his honor. And his honor, and it, well, because it's all inter, you know, it's all intertwined, but... But it clearly, well, there's another enigma. Does he pass? Well, I would say, yeah. Does he fail? Well, he, yeah, yeah in a little. He, he feels yeah, like in he a failed. little. Well, he, he, did, like he, he got a nick, you know. Yes. And so that nick was supposed to re represent. But then the Green Knight is very clear, like, like you know, you know, like you, 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 you satisfied, you know, that that nick, everything's good now, you know. And so there's a certain sense, like truth, kind of descends. <laughs> about the way things are, so that you think, well, that is really weird, mm -hmm. you know. He actually believes, I think, my interpretation, he's headed toward his death. Oh, he's oh. not going to succeed. Yeah. Everyone yeah. in the yeah. yeah. thinks yeah. he's going to uh, fail because they ignore I, him. I think that would be a reasonable <laughs> assumption of <laughs> function yeah. under, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, yet, and yet he doesn't brood about his death. That's what gets me, is like, there when he's there in the, the other castle and he's, Celebrating Christmas and enjoying. He's able to compartmentalize things yeah. in life, you know. Like, okay, I'm going to take my <laughs> beheading and put that over here. And right now, we're in. it reminds me of Christ uh -huh. as he approaches his passion. I feel like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. That's well, it's also a confession. It's yeah. confession, absolution, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. and penance. I thought that only yeah. there, 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 yes, there are being asked to sacrifice his son. Yeah. I read okay. an article. I stopped about 10 pages into it. It was a long article. It was by a psychiatrist on, and that's what they were talking about, like his ability to know that he's going to die and then go back. And yeah, it was a little bit interesting. Not, not interesting enough to finish it, but they were, <laughs> he was coming from a really, and she was, she was quoting like Kierkegaard and stuff. It was, it was interesting. Okay, so one last thing. I was thinking about the, the green and the truth, and I was thinking about the romance languages. And is that, you think, the source? So where you have veritas and, like, verdure, right? Yeah. Mm. Is, there a, is that why mm. green represents truth? Because of the way it sounds That's similar true. to the... Well, I actually wrote something down. I, there, there was, and I don't know where this saying That's comes from, point. but... Um, uh, I, see, I don't know if this is scripture or something else, but the truth of God remains eternal, mm -hmm. and that that's, and that, that's um, and that that's associated with evergreen. Yeah, the evergreenness is the truth that remains eternal. Yeah. The other thing is, all the symbols are really complex. Yeah. So, like, like the the pentangle also has how many different? Let me talk about that after yeah. the break. So yeah, I, I don't think it's it's surprising that the green man himself should represent more than one simple thing. It's 
Right. All right, let's take a break. Yeah. Um, but now we thought we'd, we better talk about uh, Sir Gawain a little bit. So we're going to start with stanza 16, uh, which is page 36 in this edition. You said 16? 16. We're trying to figure out how to pronounce the name, and then uh, sometimes it's spelled with a W in this translation. Yes. So, yeah. so yeah. Gawain, 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 or Wawain, or Wawain, or Waywain, or so. There's, there's six possibilities. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no more Waja, no more Waterwick. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say Wall Wayne. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I took Latin at KU, and I, John Sr. actually taught some of the classes, and uh, he didn't use classical pronunci pronunciation. And so that, of course, the people in the classics department, there was always a certain amount of tension because they kind of thought he was sort of a maverick and he wasn't sort of following the party line. And I remember one time he said, well, I don't know. I just, I just can't imagine Caesar saying, Wainy wiki wiki. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that settles it, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't. This guy, Wallen, Wallen. Anyway, I don't know if they did that because um, I was trying to figure why would you do that, and I was thinking, well, is that is it because he was trying to keep the alliteration in the line that he used the W because there were some other W's? Yeah, I guess on the first line of this one. So, for instance, that this this poem reminds me. I was telling these guys it reminds me a little bit of the Song of Roland, which would be an older poem written in, in old French, but that, you know, to, I remember the first time I read that, I couldn't make heads or tails out of it because there were all these different, you know, like, it, it's like reading Dostoyevsky or something, like everybody's got like three flipping names, you know, and you're <laughs> trying to keep it all straight after I start writing them down, you know, like, you know, but, you know, as it turned out, well, then, then, then somebody said, well, that, it depends on, on you know, the, the meter or what he's looking for, uh, you know, he'll, he has different, Names because they fit that line. So I was wondering if that's what he, what Paul Wayne was about. Because otherwise, I could say, okay, that's justified. But otherwise, no. no <laughs> you know, this this is a great man. I mean, you can't call him Wild Wayne. Come on, you know. So anyway, anyway, um, I usually I think it's it's this doesn't always hold true, but but very often, um, especially when you're reading uh, literature um, that, you know, to pay attention to the first lines of, of your hero, you know, that very often they'll, you know, they say something. Um, and we saw that, well, like last year when we read epic poetry, very often the very first things that, you know, like, you know, Aeneas, the first, uh, you know, even before he speaks, I think he groans. I like that groan just told so much about that poem, you know. So uh, we thought we'd go back and, um, yeah, there it is, Wall Wayne to the King. Oh, yep, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to actually, so you know, um, the Green Eyed issues his challenge. You know, everybody's kind of looking like, what? <laughs> Do what now? You know, and, and, and I think there's a certain reserve there, like, well, well, I'm reading this into it. This may not be accurate, but there's a certain silence. First of all, it's very strange, but also I think there's a reluctance to engage this fey man in dialogue because that is that, that leads to trouble. You can lead to trouble. That's he's traditional, so rude to them. you know. I think he's being very rude to them too. And yeah, they're and so they're probably a little bit like he's he's rude. They're not exactly sure where he's coming from. Wrong. His proposal <laughs> is is. Uh, absurd, you know, and, and so there, but anyway, uh, but then he insults, um, he insults the gathering, that was in 14, I think, where he says, what, this is Arthur's house, and, you know, and 
And so at that point when he begins insulting, well then, you know, Arthur can't take it anymore. And, and so he, he, he stands up to him and takes the ax, which in a certain sense is unbecoming to him, you know, because that's a barbaric weapon and he's grabbed this thing. And so you can just see some, you know, so Gowan kind of wants to, you know, at least the way I read it, wants to, he's kind of trying to, I think it partly sort of like help the king save, not save face, because I don't think Arthur is, you know, in any way whatsoever afraid, but it's just like, it's just not, it's unseemly. You know, it's just, this isn't right, you know. So he's, so he, he finally actually begins talking it in the last two lines in stanza 15, which is on page 36. Um, it says, from beside the queen, Gawain, to the king did then incline. I implore with prayer plain that this match should now be mine. And then it continues, would you, my worthy lord, said while well, Wayne, okay, this is there you got three, three doubles. Okay, so it's all about alliteration. All right, look, I forgive the guy. Okay. Would you, my worthy lord, said while well, Wayne to the king, bid me abandon this bench and stand by you there, so that I, without discourtesy, might be excused from the table, and my liege lady were not loath to permit me. I would come to your council before your courtier's fair, for I find it unfitting, as in fact it is held, when a challenge in your chamber makes choice so exalted, though you yourself be desirous to accept it in person, while many bold men about you on bench are seated. On earth there are, I hold, none more honest of purpose no figures fairer on field where fighting is waged. I am the weakest, I am aware, and in wit feeblest, and the least loss if I live not, if one would learn the truth. Only because you are my uncle is honor given me. Save your blood in my body, I boast of no virtue. And since this affair is so foolish, that it no wise befits you, and I and I have requested it first, accord it then to me. If my claim is uncalled for without cavil, cavil shall judge this court. And so they begin to judge it. And he, so, what what do we see in that first speech? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I think he has to prove himself because he feels like I'm here just because I'm a relative. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. So, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, how we're supposed to understand this in the, in the line of these stories, because is he just being, is it, is it a modesty, sort of a, you know, is it a modesty, is it, is it true humility? Uh, he says, you know, I, I'm only here because of my relation. I, I'm wondering if, if that's a little bit of, um, I don't want to say it's false modesty, because I, I think he probably really believes it, um, but that I think his status might, I'm wondering if his status is a little bit more than what he's making it out to be. But in his mind, I think he's being sincere. Um, I agree. Yeah. So, you can see that you know he asks he would, you know he's asking permission. Um, there's he wants to give the king an out a way to bow down without really making him look like he's sad. Right. So you know, there's one of the things that, that we know about uh, him is that he is fair of speech, and, and and part of the to really understand that sometimes like there are all these you know. There are all these considerations that have to be made. We see that um, really throughout the play and, and different obligations that they have. So in, in some ways he doesn't, he wants to relieve the king of this insult and the, the sort of this active, this action that was beneath them. But to do that you don't want, you don't want to 
it sold him also. So yeah. you know, it's it's really you have to be very deft with right. the way you do things. And he 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 there's only one time in this whole book that he seems to kind of lose his composure. And I think that's when the, the you know, I think that the Green Knight is, you know, swung at his head twice and it's kinda like, Hey dude, just do the job, all right, you know. You know, and it kinda like you know, you can say he's sort of he's sort of you know, he's he's annoyed by that. because uh, it talks about him speaking in I think it even says that he speaks in fury or anger. But otherwise he is always shows uh, enormous self control. Of course we're gonna really see that in the temptation scenes with the with the, the temperest lady of the house, you know, uh, there, there are so he's trying to negotiate and maneuver through this somewhat strange situation, awkward, uh, uh, full of peril, and yet at the same time not to be uh, uh, to violate any of the rules of, of chivalry. Well, even asking if it's all right for the queen if he leaves her side. Yeah. It's part of that courtesy, too. Right. Mm -hmm. So, as a side note, he's unaware that he's being set up. He's unaware of being set up. Yeah. Why, why do you think he's unaware? Because it seems to me he knows exactly. He knows what's going to happen. You do, you he think? doesn't know that the heads, that the green knights would head up. He's oh, right. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. He, yeah, he does, because he knows that in a year he's going to have his own head held. So he knows that. Yeah, he but, doesn't, but he, doesn't, he doesn't know it now. He doesn't know that the, the knight's going to survive it. Right. He right. And, 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 and the great knight it. says something like, well, I look, you know, we're going to rendezvous. No, no, in a 12 month and a day. Yeah, he but, shall have me the same. So obviously he has to survive because he's going to cut off. I, know, but I wonder if they are really taking him seriously. I don't know. Does he have to use the axe? Because he just tells him strike by strike, but. This axe. Could he have picked like the Holly and just smacked him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made things a little axe. less interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but he did he have some choices that he chose? Yes. <laughs> no, he wants him to use the axe. I think Does you're he right. say that though? Oh, yeah. Yes. This axe that is heavy enough to handle as he likes, and I shall buy the first one that was bare as, as I sit. So we can Well, that, that does add. Um, I like that reading of it, Stephanie, because if if we're to believe that um, Sir Gawain and all the knights assembled there know the drill, so to speak, of this, of this Fey man, and that this is a, an established, um, that even if maybe they hadn't experienced it, but if they're familiar with this tradition of a green man presenting himself as kind of a sacrificial victim for the oncoming of spring, that does add a layer to Gawain's sacrifice um, for the sake of Arthur, so that Arthur doesn't have to be sullied by this, by this kind of pagan. Uh, Arthur himself describes it as uh, madness, you know. Yeah. So, so I suppose that is a possibility that he does. I mean, because obviously there's a you have to you have to bridge a gap there. If if you're saying you cut off my head and then next year I'm going to do it to you, obviously there's. You either don't believe that it's going to happen to you, right. or you know that there's some some witchcraft or something going on there. So um, if he it does he does seem to see the gravity of this whole thing. So so yeah, I think that's possible that he maybe is expecting that it's not going to kill the Green Knight. I hadn't thought about that the first time I read it, but I do think that there is something to what he's saying with the, you know, the possibility, even if he doesn't know that the knight's going to pick his head up off the ground and right. walk off, that, that the possibility that this is a, a dangerous right. encounter, that this is not, and so here's the king, that everything, that Camelot mm -hmm. is built around him, and so I think he's kind of saying, much better that I yeah. should be lost than for the king. To be lost, and he, he, put, he kind of goes yeah. further and says, you know, any one of the knights is better to yeah. retain here, living in court, than me. Mm -hmm. and, and so, if somebody's got to do it, let it be me, because I'm least of all. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a nobility there that. Yeah. Well, like he's, he's the king's champion. Yeah. yeah. So it's expected of him to sacrifice. Yeah. So. Well, in this, you know, establishing the the duties. And responsibilities 
and the virtue of Christian knighthood, you know, even in that taunt from the Green Knight that, you know, that the rumor of this house runs through realms unnumbered, where's your haughtiness and your high conquest, your fierceness, fierceness and fell mood and your fine boasting, um, you know, for, for all blench, now abashed, ere a blow is offered. And so like he's, he's taunting them saying that you're, as knights you're supposed to be courageous and nobody's stepping up and that seems, um, you know, I think we talked about this on Friday, but Tolkien seemed, I mean, I could see why a young Tolkien would have been interested in this story because that's of utmost importance to Tolkien is this idea of that kind of like the higher you're, I guess, you know, we could talk about scandals in the church or whatever else, but, you know, the higher you're supposed to be, the greater the fall if you don't live up to it, right? So for, for Tolkien, a Christian knight is such a high vocation that, um, like, in the, he has a, one of his novellas, uh, Farmer Giles of Ham, a big part of that story is that all the knights are cowardly, and then this farmer with the blunderbuss is the hero of the story, right? And so this idea that, uh, like, it's a topsy-turvy world where the knights don't live up to their expectation. Um, and so I think it gets, as a reader, we start getting clued into that um, by the way that the Green Knight is kind of making fun of them. But you're, but, but you're right that no matter, no matter what he thinks is going on, he, he's certainly not sure what's happening, and he certainly thinks it's dangerous. So in stanza 17, this makes me think that maybe Arthur is not aware of how dangerous this is. Where, or maybe he's just trying to help get away and not, you know, cheer up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. That where he says, take care, cousin. One cut to address, and if thou learnest him his lesson, I believe very well that thou wilt bear any blow that he gives back later. So Arthur doesn't think that this is, doesn't seem to think that this is as much a uh, peril of life and death that yeah. it really turns out to be. I don't know. Um, Gamelin doesn't really respond to that. I wonder if he's a little more aware of the danger than Arthur is. I don't know. Well, it's repeated. So the king is assuming that the Green Knight is coming in very early as a challenge. So uh, if thou learnest him this lesson. So you yeah. have to kind of set up because he's coming in here. The king's a so very hot shot and you need to put him down to this <laughs> yeah. to a more humble level. Mm -hmm. So I think he's justifying to why he has to do it. Well, should we go on to the next section? So the, um, as you may remember, the part two um, I, starts off with this, I thought it was a really beautiful lyric interlude about the passing of the year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quickly kind of walks you through the, the different Parts of the year, um, yeah, and a little bit of chapter. Yeah, actually, there were things in there that, that reminded me of, of the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Um, and then on, when you get to page forty-four, what's Twenty-four. It's interesting that that the uh, that there are um, liturgical days are, are kind of used to mark the passage of time so there and when you get to 24 it starts off you know it's all hallows mm -hmm. and and it's at that point you know so on that day when we when we think about the dead pray for the dead his mind turns to you know well you know i'm going to have to prepare for this rendezvous with the green knight mm -hmm. um, and so he, he says in the middle of that, of that stanza that, you know, he says, I must set forth to my fate without fail in the morning. Um, and then at the end of that stanza, uh, he says, why should I be dismayed of doom? The fair or drear by a man must be assayed. So there's a sense that he's, he's really facing up to his 
doom, fate, come what may, uh, it may be good, it may be bad, but it must be, it says that it must be a saint, it must be done, it has to be dared, you know, so there's something very, I think very heroic about this. Stoic. You know? Yeah, actually it's kind of stoic, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and uh, so he begins getting ready to go, and there's this section, you know, quite a bit in there about his armor, uh, and it goes into great description, but I, I kind of want to go over to um, stanza 27, where it talks about, we actually have two stanzas that talk about the shield and the pentangle, and I, I think that this helps, this is, it, it helps us understand a little bit more about the hero that carries the shield. As you know, of course, this is, you talk about it, you know, an epic motif, you know, that the heroes, uh, their shields are significant. So we saw that, uh, you see that in the Iliad, you see that in, well, in the myth of Hercules, uh, it was in the Aeneid, you know, that the, the, the decorations on the shield are significant to what's going on. Um, and, and this is unusual because normally you, you don't, you wouldn't see this on a shield. There would be either uh, a lion or some other creature <coughs> typical of, of heraldry. So this is unusual. And so this is also part of the the poet's genius, I think, in a way to take this thing, which is another ambiguous symbol, and use it for his own devices. Then they brought him his blazon that was a brilliant ghouls, jewels, with a pentangle depicted in pure hue of gold. By the baldric he caught it and about his neck cast it right well and worthily it went with the knight. And why the pentangle is proper to that prince so noble, I intend now to tell you, though it may tarry my story. It is a sign that Solomon once set on a time to be token troth, as it is entitled to do. For it is a figure that in its five points holdeth, and each line overlaps and is linked with another. And every way it is endless. And the English, I hear, everywhere name it the endless knot. So it suits well this knight and his unsullied arms, forever faithful in five points and five times under each. Gowan was good, Gowan as good was acknowledged and as gold refined, devoid of every vice and with virtues adorned. So there the pentangle painted new, he on shield and coat did wear, as one of word most true, the knight of bearing fair. And then it talks about, so here, here so we have the, the five points of the, of the star, and then what he's saying is that for each point there, there, are, there are five pentads or considerations, okay? First faultless, was he found in his five senses. And in some translations it says wits. Okay, and we'll come back and talk about that because you can understand that in a couple of ways. So, first, faultless was he found in his five senses. And next, in his five fingers he failed at no time. And firmly on the five wounds all his faith was set that Christ received on the cross, as the creed tells us. And wherever the brave man into battle was come, on this beyond all things was this earnest thought, that ever from the five joys all his valor be gained, that to heaven's courteous queen once more came from her child. For which cause the knight had in comely wise on the inner side of his shield her image to paint it, that when he cast his eyes thither, his courage never failed. The fifth five that was used, as I find by this night, was free giving and friendliness first before all, and chastity and chivalry ever changeless and straight, 
and piety surpassing all points, these perfect five were hasped under him harder than on any man else. Now these five series in sooth were fastened on this night, and each was knit with another and had no ending, but were fixed at five points that failed not at all, coincided in no line nor sundered either, not ending in any single, any angle anywhere as I discover, wherever the process was put in play or passed to an end. Therefore on his shining shield was shaped now this knot, royally red gules were red gold set. This is the pure pentangle as people of learning have taught. Okay, so anyway, I think that, I think this is really, he's, the, the poet is really trying to get us to sort of understand the makeup of Gowan, who is in, in a certain sense I think is the exemplar of the perfect Christian knight, you know. Yeah. Um, and the, I try to, um, well, what I want to, you know, so that we, we says that, you know, about the five senses, or it could be the five wits, um, well, we know our exterior senses, sight, hearing, taste, and all that, but then some people think that it's also um, referring to the five inner senses, which would be common sense, imagination, fantasy, estimation, or memory. So that, mm. you know, um, so whether you're talking about the kind of the outer man or the inner man, there is a certain, there is an, in, an integrity there. Things, things seem to, to work, they're fit, they, they go together. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, St. Thomas talks about those, those inner senses, but then there's a little bit of a, evidently, not everybody, has total agreement on, I mean, the, the common sense and imagination and memory are, that, that, those are all pretty well established. There, this idea like, well, how does fantasy figure in there? Um, and, well, no, and I think estimation is, but I, if you leave fantasy out, then you have to pull in another one. I don't remember. It was a scholarly debate. I kind of glazed over after about five <laughs> minutes. Like, oh, whatever, you know. Okay, we get the gist, you know. <laughs> So, uh, so we have that on one of the points, and then we have, and this one, and I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts on this. The five fingers, he failed at no time. This is deeds, maybe. His acts. His... You know, I. Yeah, that's what I, I was thinking. Like, okay, you know, you're. I mean, we. You know, the hand is a significant part of the body because it's the thing that. Uh, well, we extend it to people for a greeting. We use it with tools. We use it for communication, gesturing. I mean, it's a, you know, without your hands, what would an Italian do without their hands? <laughs> <laughs> They'd be lost, you know? Um, so I, I think that's supposed to just sort of, you know, represent this human activity, okay? Um, also his prowess. Mm -hmm. Skill. His skill. At, at or mm -hmm. So he's, he's sound of mind and sound of body. Yeah. Right. With these two things. Then we have the uh, the five wounds, the five joys, and according to one person that I just automatically assumed that was the first five mysteries of the rosary, but. This other scholar said, well, actually in England, you know, the, that, that was the Annunciation and the Nativity and the Resurrection. No. They, you know, Annunciation, they, Nativity, Resurrection, Ascension, and Assumption. And Assumption. Okay. So, well, whatever. But anyway, it's very, very clear that we've got the mysteries of our faith. But the one that I, I kind of want to dwell on is this last five, the last five, which is... Um, and, you know, I guess that these would be the, the um, five essential qualities of the Christian night. In other words, that this is really kind of getting at the heart of what does it mean to be uh, chivalric. And it's interesting that you would think her courage would be on there, but it's not. Mm -hmm. 
You know, the first one is, and of course, and then this it says free giving, which would mean uh, you could you could think of liberality or magnanimity. You know, that you're 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 the great soul person. Okay. Generosity. Generosity. That doesn't work with the alliteration, though. No, it doesn't. Kind of like wowing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little side note, one mistake I think the author made is uh, he refers to it as the sign that Solomon once set uh, on a time to the total troth. But that would be the Tetragrammaton, the Star of David, which well, has six sides. Let's come back to that. But is it not? Does it, uh, yeah, we'll come back to that. Yeah. There's a... So, uh, friendliness could be understood, well, in another translation I saw that as loving kindness, fellowship, uh, concern for fellow man. What'd you say? Brotherly love. Brotherly love is a good one. Chastity, chivalry, which could also be understood as, as courteousness, and piety, okay? These five things, which are all kind of, and as we know that, that and I think this is kind of important to understand the end of the, uh, the poem, is that virtues are all, it's hard to talk about one without talking about another, because yeah. they, don't, they don't stand in isolation. They always stand in relation to yes. something else. So um, if, if you're missing one of those, then really the whole organism is put at risk. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think he seems to be so downcast at the end because even the smallest uh, failure and I think he even says this is that it affects the whole thing in other words the whole yeah. he, he sees it as, as one fault being a threat to the entire fabric of his vocation in life yes. you know and so his chivalry is being his chivalry, compromised right and so because for us you know it's kind of like well I don't know Bob you know what? If I wasn't thinking about that, I'd think, "Oh, come on, it's not that big a deal," you know. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, "Well, no, actually, it is. It is a big deal." In so, a way, oh, sorry. so I was just going to say, you can see that the poet has take, taken this sign, which I think we're going to talk about. So, I mean, obviously, that the that the pentangle has been around. It's an ancient, ancient sign. I I I, I was doing some research on that. They said there are. There are pots from Mesopotamia, yeah. back to about the time of we were reading the Epic of Gilgamesh, that have pentangles on them. So you, that that sign has been around forever, and so it makes sense that, that the, the the poet is giving this a a Christian interpretation and a beautiful one. Yeah. Now, what, now there is this question, but wait a minute, is this is that what Solomon had? And then, yeah. okay, you probably know more about that than I. Before do. that, I was just gonna say I, I think it, it, it's beautiful. Then, like, when it talks about him basically putting this sign upon him, these perfect five were hasped upon him harder than on any man else. Yeah, it almost describes it as kind of a spiritual armor, mm -hmm. uh, like um, Ephesians chapter six, almost. Mm -hmm. this. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, on the armor of God. Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah, so just this, this sign kind of represents all of these. these. So you, you have the literal armor he's wearing, but this, this is the real armor. Is this. Yeah, and yeah, we, we were talking about, you know, the, it's a beautiful image that you have this shield, and, you know, and you have that on the, on the outside, and you have a picture of our lady yeah. on the inside. So when you're shielding yourself, what are you actually looking at? You're looking at Our Lady. You know they're seeing the pentacle. You're seeing Our Lady. I mean, that, that, that's that's beautiful. <laughs> yes. well, and that's part of why he knows he failed at the end. Yeah. Versus the what you know, yeah, that, that that also that, that that explains that you know th this is supposed to be my shield. Yeah. Yeah. And so not her not the green too. girdle. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's why he knows he, how he's seen it. It's also wonderful because it reminds us that. Our Lady is not some, you know, weak, fragile porcelain thing that you know. But she's a defense, and um, she's the terror of demons, and 
Like so, the, uh, so. what the Dominican, like the rosary yeah. in the left pocket as a sword in that tradition. Yes. Do you have that as your defense? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's wonderful. No, the, okay, so Glenn mentions the, the song. So that, what we think of as the, the sign of Solomon, the, the, um, in Hebrew, they call that the uh, shield of David, actually, the, the, uh, the six-pointed star. And then the tetragrammaton as um, a, a way of kind of sealing that, in a way. And, and in Kabbalah, this gets used a lot. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, with the... So Jewish mysticism would use these things as a kind of spiritual protection, charm, this sort of thing. Um, what's interesting, I think this is referring to another tradition that's related. Um, it's actually older than Kabbalistic traditions that shows up in places like uh, the Testament of Solomon. Uh, and in the Middle Ages, these were very, very popular, these kind of... Um, Testament of Solomon is the oldest version from around the time of Christ. Um, most scholars think it was written by Jewish authors and then uh, it was quickly Christianized. And then there were all of these kind of um, sequels or, or knockoffs. And, and these became the basis of the medieval uh, grimoire, the, 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 all these kind of like magic books. And, um, and, and they, they were always composed in a way like to try and justify their existence as though, you know, these are... So the, the Testament of Solomon, for instance, tells about Solomon being an exorcist. And he's given this wisdom to deal with these demons. And then actually when he um, um, exercises demons and compels them with, you know, the name of the Lord and all these things, then he'll get them to do things for him. So, like, basically, Solomon's temple is built uh, in large part by demons, according to the Testament of Solomon. Um, and, and so the pentangle fig figures in a lot. I don't know if it's in the original. I think it is even in the Testament of Solomon. But in a lot of these medieval sequels, it begins to show up. And so it's associated with Solomon for that reason. Um, the Jewish tradition goes in a different direction, but it's similar. There's some similar ideas there. And things that I would say would not be, in, this, this is not healthy reading. <laughs> this is not something that probably we should, but it's something that people. But the stuff that you've been devoting your life to. That's right. To. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Um, so, so for instance, I, I know about the Testament of Solomon. It shows up in a collection of Old Testament um, pseudepigrapha uh, that I have. And most of it is pretty benign stuff. It's, it's you know, like the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. So legends, Midrash, about... But then you get works like this thrown in there, and you read it, and you're like, this is different. And that it was extremely popular in the Middle Ages. Did you say your blessing of the... Your blessing of the confusing stuff? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So was so, the Zohar written during the same era? Uh, okay, so the Zohar is kind of the the source book for medieval Kabbalah. And, and in a sense, there, there's a lot of pre-Kabbalah before the Zohar, but Kabbalah is kind of birthed with the Zohar. And it's it was written around the same time. It was written in the, uh, I think, the 1200s. So a little before this. There's almost some mystical incantations Oh yeah, the Zohar is, so this is the thing, Jewish mysticism is full of many, many beautiful things, and then it gets weird. And, it, and so I'm very Being cautious. For yeah, I don't, I, I don't like recommend Kabbalistic works typically to people, because yeah, there might be some things in there that are, are really beautiful, but then there are things that, it's kind of pantheistic. And uh, they believe they teach reincarnation, things like that. Jews did not believe in reincarnation until the 13th century when this 
the Zohar was published, and then it kind of overtook Judaism about that time. It's it's basically the problem with it is um, again there's authentic Jewish mysticism that is very similar to Christian mysticism, but it gets infused with Gnostic ideas very early, and and by the time you get to Kabbalah. It's really hard to appreciate it without kind of full-blown Gnosticism. In the Christian uh, grimoires, we don't have Gnosticism, but it's it's very much like white magic, right? And and so that that's not what he's doing here, but it comes from that same kind of milieu of you, you have you know well you know. Black magic, that's off limits, but there might be some other kind of magic that Christians could do that, that, that kind of gets entertained. Or, you know, astrology, we know a lot of the popes had astrologers that they would consult and such. And that's just why it fascinated me so much with your explanation of the sign that Solomon has Because that means they're referring to something very old. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I read somewhere that it was also referred to as the Druid's Foot. Mm -hmm. uh, what the heck does that mean? I don't know. We well, find these people always talk about Druids, but we don't know. We know practically nothing about them. <laughs> you know, but anyway, they practice so. human sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, well, it it is the pentangle is associated with all kinds of mysticism and magic. And, and we know that. I mean, we, we think of the upside down pentangle as, you know, uh, the foment and what all, you know, the, the, there's this. Um, and I think even at this time, it already had those associations. You mentioned the, the pottery, and, and I'm pretty sure that it, those um, dishes that they found would have been used in the temples in Mesopotamia. Wow. So it, it, it wasn't a normal, it wasn't something you would scratch, you know, on your wall just because you're decorating it, it would usually have some kind of mystical significance. Not just for Christians, but Jews. Yeah. What was it? Let's see, so you guys would know, but so Gregory the Great sent Augustine to England, right? To evangelize. And then didn't Gregory the Great talk about, you know, he wasn't have he wasn't have much success because he was smashing all the the altars. And was it Gregory the Great who said, "Don't destroy the temples"? Wasn't it Bon or was that Boniface? It was somewhere in there this idea about yeah, 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 so don't talking. don't try to wipe things clean. What you need to do is you need to baptize things. Yeah. yeah. You know. And you kind of see that in a certain sense that's going on in this in this I piece. So, You're yeah. taking these things. Which meant, and, and they're they're being uh, they're being baptized, yeah. they're being purified, and they're being and they're turned to a different account. That being said, that's this is a pretty bold move. Oh yeah, you know, I mean he, that's really that that's a bold move for that poet to do that. You know, um, and I have no idea what you know the people who heard the poem. I wonder what they thought of that. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, I don't know. But anyway, we see we see that, that that's kind of one of the things that's going on in this in the whole poem is you know taking these stories yeah. and, and, and in some ways turning them to a Christian account. Yeah. So well, okay, so we've talked about the fairies and and one of the explanations for fairy lore in places like Ireland and um, and um, the you know the that these would actually have been considered gods before Christianity came, and that they, they use different vocabulary, and they're, they're recognizing, you know, these these beings of great power and, and of mystery that before they would have actually worshipped, and now and they're still there. They've been kind of demoted in a sense by the gospel, but but that I think that yeah, there's this awareness that. The, the past hasn't just disappeared because they've become Christians, but they have to negotiate in this world differently than they used to. And they infuse symbols with new meaning for them to 
still being valid and, and even like appropriate. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, with holidays, you know, yeah. you hear all the, you know, in the, in a, I'm sure you've had this, I know I have where you get some uh, well, undergraduate student with the ax to grind of like, well, why do Christians celebrate, you know, they're celebrating always, they're celebrating a pagan goddess or, you know, they're, yeah. or they do it with Christmas too. This was an old festival and, you know, so whether it's a holiday or even sacred places, you know, so I know some of you have been to Rome and you can go to, you know, churches who, you know, pagan uh, shrines, the yeah, that, that have been re, you know, I don't want to say repurposed, but but have become, okay. have, have been baptized, you know, and become Christian places of worship. And so some people kind of with that stark, like, good, bad, or, you know, like, sacred, profane, that, that strong distinction, they can never be changed um, or scandalized by that. Um, but that's part of our Christian heritage and our tradition is the ability to do that. And, and I suppose if you believe, you know, even the conversion of an individual soul, right? I mean, we believe that somebody can go from being without God's grace to being with God's grace, which that move, what happens in the sacrament of reconciliation, for example, is such a a miraculous occurrence right. that so far exceeds anything, you know, you, you think the Big Bang is a big deal? I mean, the, the fact that somebody goes from non-existence to existence, yeah. um, if we can believe that, can't we believe that an angle, you know, would once be used for one purpose and is now being Christianized? I mean, yeah. so it's good to be in touch with that you know, ability, that power of the gospel to do that. Well, he has to leave uh, Camelot, you know, I mean, he can't delay it anymore, and so, as you remember, he's, um, and, and if, and I'm not going to read through it, but the, the, um, the description of him kind of passing, there's a certain point there where you kind of get a certain sense that he's crossing over into some other kind of place, you know, the description changes a little bit. You know, for a while there, 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 there are some references to places that would have been known, and then he kind of gets past that. Yeah. We're saying that, and it appears that everybody thinks he was up in Wales, you know, which is kind of no man's land, I guess. <laughs> not, not very nice to the Welsh, you know. Taffy was a Welshman. Yeah. <laughs> right. Is that and, what and, uh, and it's getting near Christmas, and, you know, he, he has spent a, many a night out in the elements. Uh, how he, he survived that, I don't know. Uh, but he prays to Our Lady so that he can, because he wants he wants to be able to you know to attend Mass on Christmas. Yeah. And it was right after that that he sees this castle. So this gets to be. I, and I I don't pretend to fully understand all this, and maybe we're never really supposed to. But he does. It appear he's he understands this as an answer to his prayer. Yeah. And yet at the same time that this is kind of. A, it's not there's something different here you know like you know he's out there in, in, in the wilderness which is a type of desert yep. and suddenly comes across this castle with a moat mm -hmm. and that 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 water that ring of water would signify also crossing from like that's one place into something else uh, and but then when he gets in there you know, he finds, uh, you know, good Christian people mm. pre preparing for, gosh, they're even having fish on Christmas Eve. That's old school, let me tell you. <laughs> there really is. A crop, or, you know, some people still do that. When I lived on the East Coast, Christmas Eve, everybody ate fish, and they thought, like, well, Really? Are you going to go to mass tomorrow? I mean, you know, it's been probably well, reading lobster, so I guess it wasn't that big. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, they're you know they're, they have you know a fast that he says actually this is pretty good, <laughs> pretty good, you know. Yeah. And and then you know the next morning there's mass and there's revelry and it goes on and on until I don't know I, did they get through the octave? I don't really. I, Never quite quite figure out the days, but they're getting close to New Year's, right? Yeah. And that's when the uh, and as you remember, the host and it, ne it never identifies who he is until the very end, right? So it's so, so strange that he stays and he's the he's the guest of his people, and he doesn't really even yeah. know his host's name, which is very. Um, that reminds me of. 
Greek epic poetry, you know, in the sense that they, the greater that your guest appears to be, and also your host appears to be, the longer you don't you don't ask someone's name. That's kind of un, that's sort of unbefitting. Yeah. You know, that's why I always cringe when you go to a restaurant and the first thing you go, "Hi, I'm Emily. I'll be your server today." Like, don't tell me your name. <laughs> I want to respect you. <laughs> We're not there yet. Wait until I give you a tip. You know. All right. I'm not gonna say hi. And I am Howard. I'm your appetite for today. You know? like, uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're, he doesn't even know. Right. Uh, and they don't ask him. I mean, I, I think they, they, they feed him and fed him for a while, and then he reveals who they are. And of course, their, his, his reputation has preceded him. That they are delighted. He is the uh, he is the the epitome of courtesy and also supposedly love talk or what? How do they pronounce it in here or, or translate it in here? Uh, courtly discourse, yeah. um, which is um, kind of goes back to a you know there are two strands with chivalric romance, and one of them has to do with the kind of courtly romances, which are, you talk about, there's kind of a dark side to that, too, um, which came, that, that strand comes from southern France, and, and I've read that somehow that's related to the Albigensian heresy. Have you ever heard that before? No. There's a book. Denis well, de Rougeau? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. That's his, that's his whole, and I don't know, is that, because, is that accepted? Because, because there's no real marriage, there's no real consummation, and that's, that was the Albigensian yeah. views, you know, marriage and childbearing was the worst thing you could do, because it's so, the flesh. Certainly oh this poetry and these stories that were spreading through uh, Europe were, were coming from that area at the same time as this Albigensian heresy, which was a, you know, so it's an interesting thesis. I don't know if is it is that, that like right? overcompensation then? No, you that mean the Albigensians are are so against these the, the pleasures of the body that they're gonna like. So you just flirt. Right? Yeah, the, yeah, so this, yeah. So this was so it just avoided. becomes a just it just becomes a flirtation. Kind of a romantic. Oh, okay. Talk. Yeah, Unre unrequited, un unconsummated. So okay. It's oh. Long flirtation. Okay. Oh, okay. But okay. he also demonstrates how to. Um, in that oh yeah, so that that's it. That's so kind of you. Say right. It. So th this. Um, <laughs> you are just a beautiful yeah. 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 So he, he has this ability to converse sweetly and, and talk about love, yeah. but it, it appears that he it's an elevated kind of love, you know. And yeah. and and he, he like you said, he's always deflecting. Or somewhere in there, it says it's kind of like with the conversations with the hostess's wife is it's a little bit like fencing, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and there's great um, there's kind of an artistry there, which I don't I don't know. It seems pretty dangerous to me. Like she's know? coming at him with arrows, and he's come responding with agape mm -hmm. in a way. There's a um, and then I love that before he so he like. Pretends to be asleep when she comes to. Him. <laughs> That's a great scene, you know. <laughs> and he's lying there, then. Now oh, what do you do? <laughs> this is. You know, so I just act like I'm not going to wake up. Before he realizes she's not going away. Right. She's, she's going to stay here until I wake up. So, so he started and stretched as it started. And then he. But before he does anything, he, he makes the sign of the cross because yeah. um, he knows he is in peril, and that's a it's a really that, that moved me when I read that mm -hmm. again. This is a um, he's a he is spiritually aware. Of, While her husband is out yeah. hunting him for him to give him his presence yeah. to reward. Him. Right. So so that the the. the Juxtaposition of, of the hunt scenes and the love scenes is very artful, you know. Even to the to the you know uh, the first day they're hunting for the deer, and the deer, of course, are kind of frightened by the presence of these hunters. And in that first round, 
go around, you know, he's kind of taken aback a little bit. And which is it the first one or the second one where his, his, the way he deflects it finally is he, he reminds her that she's married. Is that the first one or the it's second? The second one. Is that the second one? I don't know what he says in the first one. I can't remember. He doesn't say. He doesn't really tell us a whole lot. He just, yeah, it, it just. Uh, but it, you know, it, it kind of it, it implies that in the first round he's really surprised and uh, and that like the deer, you know, you know, eluding the hunters. Mm -hmm. um, the the second day no, when they go. I think it's the first day. He says. You are bound to a better man, the bold knight said, yet I prize the Is that the first day? Offered me. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Maybe it's the second day. Okay. It is the second day. Yeah. Okay. Second day, he says, you are bound to a better man. Yeah. So the, um, that's, the, that's the day that they're out, and there, there's that long scene there about hunting the boar, and, and that boar is uh, a frightening creature. I've never seen a boar, and, and I, if I... That's not on my bucket list, I can tell you right now. If I, if I go through life and I never really got to see a real live boar, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I really am. Because I've read about them and they're, they are frightening. Yeah. Um, Very dangerous. And uh, uh, one scholar said that these animals even represent, and I thought, I don't know, take it for what it's worth, that, that the deer represent flesh and it is it is true when they're dressing those deer they talk a lot about the flesh and that the boar represents the devil hmm. or is at least associated with the devil and they were talking you know like I, I guess there are manuscripts that show a boar trying to root out the tree of life oh. of course then you're left with what well, the fox is the world No explanation. I guess like, like oh boy, that's got to be the last one. I, I don't know. Is that fanciful? I don't know. But it, it certainly, you know, maybe, maybe there is something to that. I, I, I don't know. But I, the, the, it's very artful the way they go back and forth. And then on the, the you know, the, the, the first day of the hunt, they're very successful. And the next day, they get the boar. That's good. The last day, they get the fox. And, yeah. Okay, so uh, the deer are a little weird to me because when they go hunting the deer, they, uh, the king or the, the lord of the house, he commands that they allow the, the male deer to get through. They're only hunting the does. The court, a and court that, note in another mm -hmm. book said that that was uh, a law in England that you could only hunt the stag. I know, it seemed like it would be the reverse. Only hunt the stag. You could only hunt the stag on certain times of the year. In words, you could only go for the does. Okay. Which seems kind of... I didn't know. I know when I read that, I thought, well, okay, well, that seems strange. It, it made me think about um, Guinevere a little bit, where you have... She's really the target of all this. Uh -huh. And that, I was wondering if that was... But, and then, but here in another place, it calls them barren. Um, this is in, where did I just, I see this. Uh, here. Um, the barren line over the broad leaf. Yeah, in stanza 53. Yeah. Which, I, I don't understand that either. Like, um, how they knew they were barren, how they, you know. Yeah. Because perhaps that might be. So not barren in the sense of not being incapable of conceiving, but just not having. <coughs> okay. Okay. That that's probably correct. You know, I I don't know. Do you think? And I'm I'm just wondering this. At what point do you think he began? Got one. Gawain, um, <laughs> did he realize that, that obviously that there was something more, something, there's something more going on here than, you know, why is, why is this lady so persistent and, you know, I, I was wondering, does he, ha I, he doesn't appear to have a sense that, 
a sense that this is a an enchantress. She is something. She she is a, a, of a type that that tries to lure people, men, uh, to their to their death. Yeah. You know, because clearly, if you get, if you give into the um, the invitation, <laughs> uh, that you'll pay the price. Yeah. You know, and you know the it, it's kind of Morgan is you know associated with water, which by the way the the moat around the castle she's associated. I didn't know this, but did you know that the Marne River is actually related to Morgan's name? But anyway, there's this idea about you know we have the lake the women who have, who are in lakes or mermaids who will beckon knights and 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 but the idea is like if you succumb to their their temptations, uh, it will be to your death. Or if you're not dead, you be, then you you become their thrall. Mm -hmm. the thrall. But the lake. Mm -hmm. But but the lady of the lake also gives. Excalibur to right. Arthur. So, so like a lot of those things, it can be a little, a little ambiguous, but um, yeah. Well, of course, he doesn't think he's he, he doesn't know he's there yet. Right, he doesn't. But you know, I just kind of wonder, but, like, you think, well, yeah, what? He just really? What? Comes you know, every, well, she comes this? in every morning, more attractive each day. But, but he thinks it's a test. I just want yeah. to add there what she's doing with the seduction of the of uh, Superman is on the orders of her husband. He's te he told her to do this. We, right, but he doesn't know that. No, She's just coming on real strong. He's kind of like, come on, lady. Yeah. Yeah. She just isn't doing this out of her own will. That's right. But she really is, though, right? I don't. Because, yeah, she's tell he telling him that. Right. But I, yeah, I don't. She's really the one in charge. This reminds me of, <clears throat> I don't know, this might take us off the point, but <clears throat> it's as a parallel. <clears throat> in Don Quixote, <clears throat> there's that story where they, uh, and they're at the innkeeper in the inn, and the innkeeper's like, yeah, you guys are interested in chivalry? I got all these old books. And so like he brings out these books, and one of them is the tale of inappropriate curiosity. And it's, a, it's the story of Anselmo and Loreccio, and Anselmo is, faith, is married and he's got a great wife, but, but then he, his best friend, Lorenzo, he asks him to go and test her. Because he, and he, and he says that, you know, I, I think she's wonderful, but I can't really know. You can't really know someone until they've been tested, you know. It's easy to say somebody's good when they don't have any temptations. And then so, and Lorenzo is, refuses to do it and he, and he, and he sees that this is folly and, he says it would be disrespectful for him to be asked to do this. It would be disrespectful for Anselmo to request that this be done. It would be disrespectful for the lady, all of this. But then he eventually, he, he keeps getting tested and he weakens and he does it. <coughs> and, and, he, and then, to make a long story short, it's like, it's like four chapters in the book that covers the story. But in the end, um, the guy who does fall in love with the woman, she falls in love with him. The, the husband ends up dying of grief. The guy, the guy feels so guilty that he goes off to fight in a battle and gets killed, and the woman joins a convent. Um, so as I was reading this, I kept So it all works out. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, happy ever after, right? Um, but so I guess, but so the, those are very different stories, but just this kind of motif of, of a testing, of, and like whether that's appropriate or not. Um, the person doing the testing is different. But in that story, like, one of the morals of the story was that this was a foolish test because nobody, nobody can get through this unscathed, I guess is my point from that, from the story in, in Don Quixote. And it says, like, everyone is ruined by the story. But so here we have a testing, and Gawain gets through unscathed. I mean, I mean, basically. Almost. I mean, almost, almost unscathed. Almost. Yeah, you, you know, um, on that third day when they're hunting the fox, it looks like the fox has eluded the hunters. Did you notice that? And then it runs right into like where the dogs are being kept. You know, so it's like he had this out like, oh, the fox has escaped. Uh oh, no, it hasn't. And then you get to this story and you're like, oh, he's escaped. Oh no, he hasn't. You know. That's right. Um, yeah. 
but he, he he gets off better than this than the fox, <laughs> you know. So there was that the so you know she uh, he's that third day really puts him and I can't remember I'm trying to find the thing where it really she tests him to the okay that was on that's on in in stanza seventy. Uh, she comes into the room and, and this is down towards the bottom. He greeted her graciously with a glad welcome, seeing her so glorious and gaily attired. Her attire was uh, yeah. <laughs> so faultless in her features and so fine in her hues that at once joy upwelling went warm to his heart. Okay, so you, you know, and then it says there at the, at the very bottom, they spoke then speech is good, much pleasure was in that play, great peril between them stood, unless Mary for her night should pray. So you have the sense of that this is really coming down to the, the, the big test, and it's interesting that Mary's name is mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you have the sense that grace, you know, that he's being tempted and there's this grace that, that comes into the story. Um, it was good that you had young men read this at uh, St. Gregory's. Yeah, actually, I'm probably going to have to pay for that, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay. Uh, well, you know what? Actually, what... I don't know what... Who knows what they thought? I don't know. Anyway, let's go on. Um, so, and it says uh, on the bottom... Of, okay, this would be in seven... Uh, stanza 71, bottom of page 91, if you have this one. It's the fourth line down. So he, he, this kind of gets at, you know, I'll start at the beginning of, of 71. Okay, because this really kind of underlines all of the, the tension that's going on here. For she, queenly and peerless, pressed him so closely. I noticed in another translation it had hotly. Led him so near the line that at last he must needs either refuse her with offense or her favors there take. He cared for his courtesy, lest a caitliff he proved, yet more for his sad case if he should sin commit and to the owner of the house to his host be a traitor. God help me, said he, happen that shall not. Smiling sweetly aside from himself, then he turned all the fond words of favor that fell from her lips. So you, know, you can see, so he's got, he doesn't want to, um, to show discourtesy to the lady. He does not want to be treacherous to the host. And he definitely doesn't want to commit sin. And so he's got these different obligations. It's kind of like we were talking about there, you know, in, our, in your life you have these obligations and these things, things that you value and very often, you know, there, there's, it's sometimes kind of hard to, to how, how's this all gonna work? And, and ultimately, you know, for you can see, he's got a hierarchy here, you know? And it finally gets into, well, if I offend her, then I guess that's the way it's gonna be, you know? It's interesting that in these stories about these temptresses or these ladies of, the water, or, or whatever you want to call them, you know, they, this archetype, that um, that they'll try to tempt you to your to your peril, but if you're able to refuse them, then they respect you. Yeah. You know, they do. And and um, but then in that at that moment when it looks like maybe the crisis is passed, she plays a different game than kind of like the the woman reviews or the woman, you know, unrequited love or whatever. So she's, she immediately starts kind of playing a different way of kind of getting at him a little bit. And then she offers him, well, look, you know, can't you give me some token? Well, I don't really have any tokens right now. I left them, them, them all back in Camelot. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's probably true, you know. Uh, and then she goes, well, I want to give you a token. 
you know, and she tries to give him that ring. No, no, I'm not taking any ring, that's for sure. Well, then what about, I shall give you my girdle. That's on, that's in uh, stanza 73 and on page 94 where she says, I shall give you my girdle, less gain will that be. She unbound a belt swiftly that embracing her sides was clasped above her kirtle under her comely mantle. Now, I don't know what these words mean. I, I, this is probably, you know, in Middle English for lingerie. Or, I don't know what it is, but anyway. Anyway, this is something, you know. Uh, fashioned it was of green silk and with gold finish. So now we have that color coming back. You know, where it's green and there's a little bit of gold in there, so that, that should make us automatically think of, of the Green Knight, and that, our, you know, that there, there's danger here. Um, and then I'm gonna skip a, lot, a little bit of this and go down to the... Um, he, at first, he's, you know, he, he's, he, he's not going to accept that, because she says at, at late, uh, stanza 74, do you refuse now this silk? said the fair lady, because in itself it is poor, and so it appears. See how small it is in size and smaller in value. This is like, this is nothing. Don't worry about it. Okay. But one who knew of the nature that is knit there within would appraise it probably at higher, at a price far higher. For whoever goes girdled with this green ribbon, while he keeps it well clasped, closely about him, and is, there's that word clasp, isn't that what they said about the shield, that he clasped the shield? So you, you get, you know, we, we end up here with these opposing mm -hmm. images, the shield and the girdle. And he's supposed to be clasping his shield. She says, well, if you keep up this well clasped, there is none so hardy under heaven that to hew him were able for he could not be killed by any cunning of hand. So Tintrin, she says, hew him, which would make him think a little bit about the beheading game, okay, and the cunning, okay, because he is a cunning man. The knight then took note and thought now in his heart t'would be a prize in that peril that was appointed to him when he gained the green chapel to get there his sentence. If by some slight he were not slain, twould be a sovereign device. Then he bore with her rebuke and debated not her words, and she pressed on him the belt and proffered it in earnest, and he agreed, and he gave it very gladly indeed, and prayed him for her sake to part with it never, but on his honor hide it from her husband. And he then agreed that no one should ever know, nay, none in the world, but they. Wow, isn't that, you know, she works at him and she works at it, and she works at their pairing, and then finally, at the last second, she catches him, you know. And it, it is, you know, two things there. One, and I, you know, and I, I was wondering, is this supposed to be ironic? It says that he thinks, you know, when I get to Green Chapel, if by some slide I was able to avoid being slain, that would be a sovereign device. What is he, I mean, how do we, and I don't know what other translations say, but what, what does that mean, sovereign device? Is he thinking God is providing this thing for me? Mm -hmm. Or just that it, I don't know. Um, I took it to be as a small moment of doubt on his part that he's doubting now in his in the five senses, the five joys, the five wounds, Mary's intercession. He's saying that I'm going to need something special yeah. for this, yeah. something different, or, something or, that I or, don't currently have. Or is he hedging his bet a yeah. little bit? I mean, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I guess he's not throwing all that off, but he's right. saying I, I, need, I need something that I don't yet have. But he's I mean, saying, yeah, he's saying those things aren't enough. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've heard about graveyards, 
in Scandinavia where, you know, you've got, you know, invocation of Christ on one side and then one of the Norse gods on the other. You know, like, hey, you know, just, just cover it all my bases here, you know. Uh, anyway, you cut it, it, it is a, it, it's a flaw. It's a chink in the armor. You know, it's kind of like so he's going to hide it. Right. right, and that is, and that's, that's a surprising him. thing yeah. is that yeah. then, I mean. Because he's supposed to give it to him. That's the gift that he's received, so he should give it to him. Right, so he. The master when he returns. So he, he, in a certain sense, is, is um, well, he, he says it's treachery. Doesn't he later on? He goes, yeah. I'm guilty of cowardice and treachery. Yes. And say, like, is well, okay, did you violate the games, mm -hmm. the rule of, the rule of the game? Yeah, you did. Is that yeah. is that treachery? Mm, I don't know about that. She's compromised because she's, she's called upon his honor to obey her. Right. Instead of on his honor to hide it from her husband. Yeah. So, so that. Now, yeah. So it, which is not honorable. And right. then he goes to confession. Yes. But he yes. didn't give the girdle back. The priest should have said, hey, I can't solve it. You gotta, you gotta return that girdle, pal. You know, come back after you've done that. It's not a good confession. Right. Because he's still intending to commit the sin. That's right. In this other, in this other translation, it states, uh, what appraises properties is more precious, perhaps. When a man divides his body with his green, belt of green, as long as he laps it closely about him, no hero under heaven can hack him to pieces, for he cannot be killed by any cunning bird. So it's like he takes it on as a, uh, a shield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could actually protect him. I mean, somebody would say, well, you know, magic will protect me against magic, right. but in a certain. Well, well the Green Knight had no shield, so. But he kind of used trickery as well, so he's kind of playing into his own game. I, I really, you know, they're all happy that Galen comes back in the end, but he's not because he feels he's failed in that, you know, if he'd really been noble as he had been called to be, he wouldn't, he would have lost his head. Mm -hmm. He would have, I, I think for him to really um, fulfill the quest mm -hmm. means to follow our Lord to the end. And, and he doesn't do that. He yeah. fails in embracing, embracing death uh -huh. in the end. Yeah. Before the before the, I knew what how the outcome would be. This this section caused me to think that that, that this was the snag. He had um, oh my gosh, incriminated himself. It was very yep. symbolic, but this was evidence. So he had to hide it, and and that and what I thought was going to happen is that he was going to get caught with his evidence, and he was going to be convicted of having been adulterous, encouraging the adultery with a woman, and that would cause his execution. That's what I thought was going to happen until I read the whole. The, yeah. the story doesn't work on a, on modern love, levels because no, it, it reads is. like it has a happy ending, <laughs> right. and, and I think even it's intended to right. seem like a happy ending. But it's it's very Tolkienian in the sense that it's a happy ending, but it's not an undeserved happy ending. Yeah, of, that everything's okay now. It's a there's a triumph, but it's not a total triumph. It's not a complete triumph. Yeah, he's going to have that scar yeah. with him. A wound, a sign of a wound. Yeah, and it's a scar too. It's but he both. can't. It's both. But they can't glory in his martyrdom. He's not. No. And I agree with with also that point. And I, I was thinking along similar similar lines. And Howard, you were talking about the integrity and kind of this idea that for for this code, you know, you couldn't just have one virtue or just one success. You had to be consistent. Yeah. And so it was this kind of. Um, it We're all interconnected. Everything's interconnected, and so, so for him, um, you know, all all of these temptations, that he, he doesn't just get to focus on one. So he, he's got to hold this delicate tension. There's a hierarchy of loyalty that is fleshed out eventually. That he's primarily loyal to God, but that doesn't that doesn't mean he can disregard all these other obligations. And so the fact it sounds kind of silly to us, but it's essential to him that he's courteous. That's right. He can't get rid of courtesy. 
because to sin against courtesy is still a sin, and so it's going to unrival the, all, all his his whole code. And so what I thought was interesting is that it didn't seem coincidental or ra- it didn't seem random that um, that the token that he accepted was was of intimate nature because the yeah. sin that he conquered. Um, He's now kind of implicit. He appears to be guilty of it yeah. based on the smaller sin that he took. So it's like he, right. to me, it's like he's, it's like he can't be free of the big sin because he's taken the small sin, which represents right. the bigger yeah. sin too. Yeah. So it's like so to him, he feels as guilty as if he would have fallen the first yes. time. That explains his self mortification in mm-hmm. him. He's, he's, he's committed, he's committed to, to insulting himself. Yeah, it's like I might as well I might as well have fallen yes. in the bedroom yes, because I fell in faith yeah, here, and so I've got to wear it's like a scarlet yeah. letter type thing. That's it's like a, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of how I read it. Me. It's like was the the green knight then killed and not kill him because that could have been enough of a sin mm-hmm. to to receive right of losing his head. Yeah. Or did he show just enough goodness that this point? Right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I don't mean to get off topic, but I, there's a scene in uh, Lord of the Rings, I think it might be the, whichever one, Two Towers, possibly, or Return of the King. He's having a conversation with Lady Erwin, and he's going off into that cave with all those cowardly spirits, the half deads. And, and she dead. sees him leaving on his horse, getting ready to leave, and she questions him. And by now she's fallen in love with him. But he, he he's not accepting her. And she doesn't make advances. She's very proper. But he doesn't understand why she wants him to stay with those who love him. Don't you know? She says to him, and he and he answers, "I I cannot give you what you ask." So that's when she becomes very hurt and realizes that he's not going to uh, respond to her gesture of love. But he also has something quite lovely. Reminds me of the courtesy here of Sir uh, Wayne. He he says when he is departing. Last words he says to her are, um, "Since I first met you, I have only wished you joy." And so that was supposed to help her get gain comfort, which I don't think she ever did because she went into battle knowing she was likely going to die. But I saw a parallel there mm-hmm. with his with King Aragon's chivalry and this. Uh-huh. It's, it's mm-hmm. a different story. It's not in the same book, but it existed in that. Well, it, it is actually the same author. Well, <laughs> Come translator. Translator. <laughs> translator. Or translator. translator. I meant, yeah. Okay. There you, go. you can see why he was interested, I think. Yeah. Perfectly. Yeah. That's a good point. Huh. Her real joy was in Faramir, but she didn't know it yet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that was lovely. This misdeed is not as, I don't know, go back to the misdeed on page 52 where when he had the maid and then he went to Bass and anyway, evidently these two misdeeds that occurred on his trip, this one is the more severe. Or maybe I've misinterpreted. Where, the, I don't think of the other one. Where's the, the first one? What stands in? Th- 32. It's at the end of 32. Page, uh, page 52, or it's page 32. My page numbers are different, but I have to say. He speaks of it as a misdeed um, on that self same night. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, lamenting his misdeed. Sorry, what's the answer? In, it's a stanza at the end of stanza 32. He says, In prayer he now did ride, lamenting his misdeed. He blessed him oft and cried, The cross of Christ me speed. 
I think I think that well the the, the misdeed would be not attending mass on Christmas Day. Okay. Uh, because right before that, he, 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 he prays and he says, I beseech thee, O Lord and Mary, who is the mildest mother, most dear, for some harbor wherewith honor I might hear mass and thy matins tomorrow. This meekly I ask, and then I pray a pot to her hobby and creed. In prayer, you now did write lamenting his misdeed. I, I think the misdeed would I think be. He's going to make it to mass. That, yeah, I'm not. I, I, yeah, this isn't going to. Because he hasn't done anything. Right. Yeah. Um, Interesting. And then, but then right after that, mysteriously, yeah. right after the, the sign on himself, he had set but thrice ere a mansion he marked within, within this mode. Yeah. So. It's, so he hasn't even attempted yet. The idea of fairy masses is interesting because this is <laughs> there, here he is. Right. And this is not a a human castle that they're having mass there. That's that's kind of interesting. Uh -huh. So Pawnee says he mauled heads. How does that end the story? Evil will the shame be to him who thinks where, where is that? That's the very end. The last oh. line. Oh. Yeah. Well, actually, that's not the line. It's not in the poem. It's been added. Okay. Someone later added that. That's not in the in the poem itself. It's, it's in it's both a, translations. Yeah. I know, but it's not in the poem. Yeah. yeah. So, I what's mean, it mean? There's an amen. Well, it's the it's the motto of the Order of the Garter. That's the, Garter. the Order of the Garter, right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even thought about that. Shame be the man with evil in his mind. Yeah. I had kind of forgotten about that with the in the wow. St. George oh, connection. Asked, what I've heard is it came about because someone thought he interpreted an action at court to think that it meant that the king and another woman were lovers. And so the king says... He has her garden, her, and he says, if, you think, if you're thinking something dirty, stop. I'm your king, and I don't wear a garden. I had forgotten about that, yeah. But it's not, according to the trend, the, what I've read, it's not part of, originally part of the poem. That's why there's the all man, is the last word of the poem, and this was added uh, in the, to the, to the manuscript afterwards. Kind of tying, tying that tradition back to this story. Right. So it's kind of an interpretation of it, though. It's, uh -huh. it's for us to say, are we are we going to judge Sir Gawain as, uh, as uh, sternly as he's judging yeah. himself? Should we judge him right. as as sternly as he is, or should we have some of the same mercy that the green not have? I, I, when you guys were talking, I was just I thought about the, um, you know, you have this, the, the pen tangle, which, you know, was, was kind of reinterpreted and I don't know, is this far-fetched to say that the girdle, which Gowan calls it, I wrote this down, he calls it the figure of faithlessness. And yet that figure of faithlessness becomes this kind of almost this, like every, you know, or there's the world, we're all going to wear some, an emblem of that faithlessness, where in certain sense it kind of, it becomes a kind of a, a sign of humility. Yeah. In other words, we have our ideal, it's on the shield, but if we're honest to ourselves, we all are faithless. And he even says, when I'm tempted to pride, I can look at that ribbon and I'll remember yeah. who I'm, you know. Um, but in, in a certain sense, that thing 
get turned also. So you, know, you have both of those symbols um, are reimagined and take on a newer, deeper meaning. Uh, the, the, it's a recognition of failure and, and a lack of perfection, but then also tying that tradition that Stephanie was talking about. It's you know, I'm, I'm even thinking of you know, like the crown of thorns. This idea that you're like you're bearing something that you that the, you're not guilty of the thing that the mm -hmm. token suggests that you're guilty of. Mm -hmm. So we're in the garter. He's not guilty of the one, but it's a reminder of you know, that fabric of that if, if I've sinned even in a small thing, it's still a big deal. Which is, I think, one of the refreshing things about this book is that yeah. kind of that scrupulosity. I mean, we yeah. nowadays, even, I mean, even that term, well, you know, and you have whole, like, people writing books about, like, how to deal with scrupulosity. And I'm certainly not discounting that some people really do have a psychological disposition to an irrational scrupulosity. But as far as the general public, we are not a people who is scrupulous. Right. We, we far more, we're far more dismissive. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, that'd be a hard case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> argue. Um, well, we are scrupulous well, about cigarette smoke. Well, yeah. And there are a few things that we're very, you know, uh, not yeah. recycling. Right. Recycling. Uh, 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 scrupulous, uh, but, you know. But when it comes to the Ten Commandments, right, yeah. yeah it's it's kind of like those, those people down there. Oh, yeah, I hear that sound down there. Oh, it sounds yeah. like you're having a. Party. <laughs> the reading today, yeah. Right. Uh, that that doesn't sound like that that was, a victory yeah. to me. Yeah. 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 We, we see this as a venial sin that he's committed. Uh -huh. I think Arthur's court sees this as a venial sin. Uh -huh. And uh, it's obvious that Galen does not. Yeah. And, and the truth is, none of us are in a position where we can tell whether it is or not. He's the only one. Mm -hmm. Between him and God, he's the only one who knows mm -hmm. whether this was a more serious sin or not. Um, well, in Sunday's in Sunday's readings, with um, Abraham asking God, you know, five people, five, ten people, yeah. or the ten people, would he be one person? And so, I mean, would would Gallon be one good person in Solomon Court, or no? He wouldn't be. Oh, I he, think he would be. I mean, I, I was thinking he would be. But, <laughs> yeah. He's I good. mean, would he say the? Would he say this city one good person? No. <laughs> so. there, there's one good night in Camelot. Gawain, 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 Gawain will be the one who convinces the world. Well, with King Arthur, there's, always, there's the French tradition, and then there's the yeah. So in more than Arthur, at least, Gawain's the one who convinces Arthur to go after Lancelot. Okay. And then he repents. This saying, oh, okay. this saying, you raised the English for me, be shame to the man's evil. Well, yeah. It's shame. shame be to the man who has evil in his mind. Yeah, there's yeah. different translations. Yeah. But yeah. I discovered that it's a French maxim, and there's an order of the guard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's what yeah. I mean. And the, 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 the St. George is yeah. for chivalry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very. The cool. knights, they're still, they're still knights of the garter, and at, at Windsor Castle, the Catholic Chapel of St. George oh, is the side of the hmm. knights of the garter. I had totally forgotten about that. All right, well, um, we've got lunch, I hope, downstairs. Um, Hamlet next week.